Great. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And we're uh, starting to enroll the participants here, and we'll give that a minute or two as we populate the room. And welcome to Biotech by the Lake 2022. We'll begin in about 100 seconds. Okay, well, why don't we uh, go ahead and begin as uh, people still get enrolled into the participant environment there on Zoom. Uh, good morning and uh, hello everyone. Welcome to Biotech by the Lake 2022. My name is Neil Kelleher and I'm your host today. I'm also the director of the Chemistry of Life Processes Institute here at Northwestern and I also direct Northwestern Proteomics. We are very happy to welcome all of you to today's program. And first and foremost, I'd really like to thank Oppenheimer for their support and partnership over the past four years, and particularly Jay Olson, who will uh, be the caboose on this train and round us out um, uh, for this morning's and this afternoon's activities, depending on where you are. Jay is a research analyst at Oppenheimer who was instrumental in developing today's program, and he'll lead the biotech financing and investing panel discussion later in the program. We're also grateful to the, to the team at BioCentury for their help in shaping today's program. I look forward to hearing from Karen Tejach Tuzman, Senior Editor and Head of Discovery and Preclinical Development at BioCentury, and she'll mod moderate today's panel on hot topics in protein therapies and technologies. I'd also like to thank the Institute's Extraordinary uh, Advisory Board, who are instrumental in our launch of this program four years ago, and I'd especially like to recognize Sue Jewel Shah, president and CEO of SEMA Bay Therapeutics, who originally inspired us to reach out to Oppenheimer and put all this together. Before I turn it over to the speakers, I'd like to provide a brief overview of the Chemistry of Life Processes Institute and an exciting initiative that's underway at Northwestern Proteomics. The Chemistry of Life Processes Institute was founded by Northwestern in 2004, and its charter was to provide a destination for entrepreneurial and translationally minded faculty to catalyze new therapies and diagnostics to address the biggest clinical challenges of our, of our time. Uh, one of our biggest inspirations is an incredibly talented chemist named Rick Silverman, who's a founding member of the Institute, and Rick was the inventor of gabapentin, also known as the blockbuster Lyrica, first approved for treatment for fibromyalgia and diabetic neuropathy. He contributed part of his royalties for the invention toward the construction of Silverman Hall, where the Institute is housed today. CLP is home to Northwestern Proteomics and six shared facilities for drug discovery and development. Our faculty members are highly entrepreneurial and interdisciplinary. They include chemists, clinician researchers from Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine, life scientists, biomedical engineers from the McCormick School of Engineering and more. In the past decade alone, CLP investigators have spun out 33 new companies to commercialize more than 75 new therapies, diagnostics and devices, attracting more than 2.5 billion in external investment. In addition to translating their discoveries, a number of CLP faculty and researchers, including myself, are deeply involved in the development and deployment of cutting edge technology platforms that accelerate biomedical research. And you'll see evidence of that right off the bat with uh, Shana Kelly's talk. As the head of Northwestern Proteomics, I have spent the better part of my career partnering with tech companies like Thermo Fisher Scientific to develop more precise ways to dis discover and characterize the different forms of human proteins using mass spectrometry. One of the main thrusts in my research is top-down proteomics, an approach that allows for precise determination and characterization of different variations of proteins called proteoforms, derived from the expression of a single human gene. 
I'll note that we just co-invented and launched with Thermo Fisher direct mass technology, uh, leveraging the latest in innovation in single molecule mass spectrometry. For the uninitiated, here's a quick overview of the science and will we'll help uh, frame our discussions today about protein level human biology. Our genes, and most all of you know that there's 20,300 human genes now annotated in the human genome, and they provide uh, uh, the instructions uh, and that produce the parts lists of our bodies. But of course, genes don't tell the full story. Proteins, the engine in this slide, form the building blocks of all our cells in our bodies and communicate among cells. And if you'll allow the metaphor, this, this body of the, is, our, is our car, if you will. And proteiforms, the different forms of protein molecules, steer and cell behavior and even help decide cell fate and outcome, phenotypic outcomes for a whole organism. When things go awry with our proteiforms, diseases develop and spread. Because the tools are expensive and science complex to define proteiforms, less than half of 1% of the body's estimated 1 billion proteiforms have yet to be precisely weighed and characterized to date. Um, why is this problem important? Well, um, proteiforms are underlie and are the main drivers of uh, human health and disease. They're involved in every kind of disease from cancer to Alzheimer's to heart disease. Even organ transplantation outcomes are determined by proteiform biology. Therefore, compute, complete knowledge of the entire human proteome will help unlock better and more precise targets for drug development, early detection of all human disease, and higher organ transplantation success rates. As I mentioned earlier, the top-down approach to measuring proteiforms is the best method for capturing everything we need to know about the composition of proteins in our bodies. But it's expensive and technology needs further refinement, which is why many still use the bottom-up approach in, in proteomics, which leaves lots of knowledge gaps. Uh, <clears throat> and so therefore in 2012, um, I was co-founding president of the, and formed the Consortium for Top-Down Proteomics, an international research consortium of more than 400 scientists committed to launching a scientific moonshot called the Human Proteiform Project to systematically discover proteiforms in every cell type and body fluid in, in, our, in the human organism. The project is patterned after the highly successful Human Genome Project, another massive undertaking that took about 15 years and about $3 billion to complete. Like the Genome Project, a major investment in technology and research will be required, with our estimate currently that the Human Proteiform Project will take 10 years and $1.3 billion to complete. As part of the Human Proteiform Project earlier this year, Northwestern Proteomics launched the Human Proteiform Atlas, an online resource of experimentally verified human proteiforms, now numbering a couple hundred thousand, to be stored and accessible to the global scientific community. And my last slide here is um, what's next. Our immediate goal is to uh, generate more success cases uh, like a paper in science in January showed for transplantation and 57,000 unique proteiforms. In terms of technology development, we'll continue to improve and develop more high speed, low cost methods, driving cost points down to a dollar per proteiform, like a dollar per base in the Human Genome Project 20 years ago. This will lead to more precise approaches for diagnosing and detecting disease, in addition to providing more precise readouts and targets for our drugs that will be developed. So thank you for your attention. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping notes. Uh, after each presentation and panel discussion, we'll take a few questions from the audience as time allows. To ask a question, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and submit your questions. And I'll field those and provide uh, a facilitation as the MC today. We'll select as many questions as time allows and share them with speakers and their responses. Um, thank you and enjoy the program. So now I'd like to pivot and in introduce our first faculty speaker, that's Shana Kelly. Uh, Shane is the Nina B. Schwartz Professor of Chemistry and Biomedical Engineering and a member of the Chemistry of Life Processes Institute at Northwestern University. Um, Shana, please take the floor. 
and welcome. Thank you, Neil. Really delighted to, to be here today. And thanks to everyone who uh, supported and put this great event together. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you today about some of my group's work on rare cell profiling. And I'm trying to get my slides to go forward here. Okay. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we've developed this capability and how we are applying it to discover new therapeutic targets. I'm a bioanalytical chemist by training, uh, really do technology development, creating new platforms that can allow us to uh, collect data that's never been collected before to answer lots of, of interesting biological questions that can drive the development of new therapeutics. We have a number of, of platforms up and running in the group, but I'm gonna focus in today on this middle one here that's focused on single and rare cell profiling. And the driver behind uh, our developing this capability was just wanting to be able to characterize really rare cells in complex samples. And we have a lot of great single cell methods these days. We can do single cell genomics and uh, all kinds of, of omics. But if you look at the requirement for how many cells and the purity of the sample that you need to start with, it's quite high. I was recently talking to one of my trainees about doing a single cell RNA-seq uh, study on, on some T cells from a patient sample. I said, how much material do we need? And he said, well, you know, probably an apheresis bag would, would get us there. The number of cells you need to do single cell omics is actually very, very large and, and prohibitive for lots of different kinds of samples. We thought that if we had a better tool, we could look at really interesting cells in the blood, like tumor reactive T cells that might be floating around in, in the peripheral blood or circulating tumor cells that have broken off of a, a tumor and are telling us something about the phenotype of a, a patient's uh, lesions. Or we could more efficiently comb through libraries of CRISPR edited cells. And I'm gonna tell you uh, quite a bit about how we're using that capability today. And right now we're really uh, constrained by the, the types of technologies that we have at our disposal to do this type of analysis in complex samples. And the reason for that is that most single cell level technologies are actually serial. So they look at one cell at a time. And so it takes you a long time to look at a large collection of cells. And it can be very confusing to look at complex mixtures of cells because there's so much uh, information that, that isn't actually relevant that still needs to, to be processed. So a few years ago, we developed a, an approach that we call magnetic ranking cytometry. So this capability in some ways is quite similar to, to flow cytometry. And we even have a preparative version of it that's, that's somewhat like facts. And it basically uses uh, immunomagnetic staining instead of immunofluorescence staining in order to identify rare cells. So we take very small magnetic nanoparticles we coat them with an antibody that is specific to a protein of interest. And then we basically array the cells along the microfluidic device according to how many magnetic particles they're carrying. It's a very simple uh, operation principle. And once we're done processing a sample, all the cells we don't care about flow away. So we're not looking at those. The ones that we do care about that have been bound by our magnetic nanoparticles are on the microfluidic device. And then cell by cell, we do this with 100% automation, so it's, it's nice and fast. We create the kind of histogram that's shown at the bottom of this slide where we're collecting single cell level information on protein expression, uh, again, in a complex sample, and we can then uh, calculate expression indices. We can look at the level of heterogeneity for rare cells in a complex sample and derive a lot of information from this measurement. What we've shown is that the quantitative abilities of this approach are very similar to flow cytometry, which is just a, a workhorse uh, approach in, in almost every biology lab, even many chemistry and biochemistry labs, basically use a fluorescently labeled antibody. You pass the cells through a, a machine that measures the fluorescence of each cell, and then you get these same types of histograms. These are shown in the inset on this top graph here. Our data looks quite similar, uh, really calculates the same type of, of measurement in terms of protein expression, but we can go very low in terms of cell numbers. So 10 cells in a milliliter of whole blood, we get the same protein expression index as if we just had pure cells that we were passing through a flow cytometer. So this is quite a, a powerful capability and we've shown that we can apply it to surface proteins, 
We can fix and permeabilize cells, go inside, quantitate RNAs, quantitate intracellular proteins. And then importantly, we can also do this at a preparative scale. So we can isolate cells with very high resolution and high levels of throughput based on levels of protein expression. So here we have, a, again, a fluidic device, and we're not trying to measure protein expression, but trying to capture a subpopulation of cells. And so we do that by having these compartments in the device. On the top, you can see they're just kind of these discrete areas within the device. We can have four, we can have 10, we can have 20, it depends on the resolution of the sort. Once we process the sample, we can walk away with a compartment with the cells of interest and expand, sequence, do whatever kind of omics we want to. We get very high recovery levels, very high levels of viability. So this is another capability that, again, it, it really goes way above and beyond what you can do, let's say, with FACS or even with MATS, which is a, another magnetic uh, technology. And it's allowed us to do some really interesting things, very much related to therapeutic discovery. And if I had more time today, I'd tell you about two different areas that we're really excited about. So we've applied this approach to kind of discovering and developing next generation cell therapies. Because we can look at very rare cells, we've been able to identify a new class of cells with therapeutic properties. These are tumor reactive cells that you can find in the peripheral blood. We're launching a new company uh, based on this, venture-backed, it's called uh, Control Therapeutics. So I won't have time to go into that story today, but it's really exciting. If you have an interest in cell therapy, please uh, get in touch with me offline. But what I do wanna spend the time on today is how we've applied this approach to really uh, expedite what we can do with phenotypic functional genomics to really drive therapeutic target discovery. And so we have an effort underway at Northwestern that we refer to as LeapFrog. So this is large scale phenotypic functional genomics at scale. It relies on the same type of microfluidic approach that I just described to you. We actually have two different platforms that are shown here in the middle. And the way that we work through this is we use functional genomics where we create libraries of CRISPR edited cells. Every cell has one CRISPR mediated gene knockout. And so we have a library of let's say a billion cells that we need to sort through to look for interesting phenotypes. We find those cells using our microfluidic approach and magnetic ranking cytometry. And we now have a, a whole group of projects and programs where we're looking at all kinds of, of really interesting disease-related phenotypes, the level of protein expression, protein modification, protein secretion. And this is a way to do phenotypic functional genomics in, in a very unique way because of the throughput of this cell isolation approach. We can process an entire CRISPR screen in one hour. And what that allows us to do is large panels of disease-related targets. We can look at large panels of cell lines, we can look at panels of time points and conditions and build up very large multi-dimensional data sets. And if you were to try to do these types of CRISPR screens, let's say with a fax machine, at best you're gonna do one at a time. It's gonna take you a few weeks. We can do a large panel in, in an hour. And what we found is that LeapFrog produces data regarding the regulators of disease-related phenotypes that the quality of the data is much higher than what you get using conventional methods. And so what this means at a practical level is the data validates really well. The hits coming out of our screen, uh, they validate beautifully. And I'm just gonna take you through a few short stories of, of things that we've done with the platform. Uh, this is really more of a, a teaser talk than anything. I won't get into to too much depth on, on any of these areas, but would love to talk to anyone who, who's interested uh, again, offline, feel free to get in touch. And so we have different projects that are really evolving into to programs because of the depth, depth of the data sets. Uh, we have active projects uh, looking at KRAS modulators and, and mutant KRAS in oncology, autoimmune and inflammatory re regulators. We have uh, several projects up and running on, on new immune checkpoints. And we also do some work on antibody manufacturing. And I'll describe that very briefly at the end. But just to give you a sense of kind of how this all got started and, and the kinds of hits that we're able to generate, I'll just say a few words about an early study that we did looking for modulators of CD47 expression. CD47, as you probably know, is considered to be an immune checkpoint. So CD47 
interacts with SERP alpha, which is a protein uh, expressed by macrophages. Macrophages use SERP alpha to check cells to see if they should get rid of them and phagocytose them and take them uh, out of play. And tumor cells have learned to overexpress CD47 because it allows them to do immune evasion. If they have CD47 on their surface, it's a don't eat me signal, the macrophages just go away. So we wanted to ask the question using the, the leapfrog technology, if we could find regulators of CD47 to allow us to take it off the surface of tumor cells. And this was an area where there was already a lot of interest in the clinic and, and in the pharma and biotech industry. Quite a bit of work had gone into the development of antibodies that could bind CD47 on the, the surface of tumor cells, quite a few programs in the clinic, but definitely uh, constrained to blood-based tumors, difficult to, to get the antibodies that have been developed into solid tumors. And so we thought that by looking for regulators, maybe we could find something druggable, maybe we could go over to a small molecule and have a new way to get at CD47 uh, for the development of, of a new therapeutic. So we did this first screen. Uh, we did it head to head with, with facts actually just to kind of test out the technology. Found a very interesting hit that was the one of the top hits on our screen. It was an enzyme that is called QPCTL. And this is an enzyme. It actually cyclizes glutamine to form pyroglutamate. And at the time, there was no known association between CD47 and QPCTL. We had absolutely no idea what this hit meant biologically. If we did searches and databases, we just got a blank page. There was nothing connecting these two factors. And we really dug in and, and tried to understand the, the biology and the biochemistry, really scrutinized the, the crystal structure of CD47 and saw something really interesting. And that is that there's a pyroglutamate modification at the end terminus of CD47. And this had been observed before, the crystal structure, but it was assumed that this was just a spontaneous cyclization that happened and that there wasn't any enzymatic activity involved here. With this hit in, in hand, we knew that there probably was a, a direct link. And probably what had gone on in our screen is that the antibody we were screening with without the modification was reading that out as a, a change in expression. But nonetheless, we were able to show that if we drugged QPCTL, we were fortunate to get a tool compound that we could just take off the shelf. And if we hit cells or either in vitro or in vivo, that we could see this modification being lost from CD47. And we could also see that this diminished SERP alpha binding and also then kind of turned off that, that immune checkpoint uh, interaction that tumor cells use to, to fool macrophages. So this is a really interesting uh, new target that we're taking forward. We have attracted interest. We're working with uh, Evatac to, to go after new composition of matter, uh, to, to develop a, a program around CD47. So really exciting progress. We're actually coming out of that, that effort with some really interesting compounds uh, pretty soon. And then we're also moving on to look at uh, other checkpoint inhibitors, and uh, we have some other new programs that are, are going in that area. So that's one of the, the areas that we've been working in, and then I'll just breeze through a few others. Um, we thought this, pro this um, approach would be really well suited to looking for regulators of mutant KRAS. Again, an area I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with. There are KRAS mutations in many different solid tumors, there's been some really interesting progress in this area recently with uh, the Amgen inhibitor of G the G12C mutant of KRAS, but there are other very common mutants of KRAS that are gonna be difficult to go after with the same uh, strategy. So G12C, there's a cysteine residue there. There's this unique sulfur atom that one can target with a covalent inhibitor. G12V, on the other hand, does not have that chemistry. All you have are methyl groups and it's a little difficult to, to go in there with some unique chemistry. So we wanted to look and see if we could find regulators of, of specifically mutant expression. If you do a pan KRAS uh, approach, you're gonna take down wild type KRAS and, and that causes problems just given the essentiality of, of KRAS. And so we did a screen to look specifically at regulators of mutated KRAS this just shows you some data that we generated in a G12V cell line. And then we counter screened with a wild type cell line and found some very specific regulators of the G12V 
mutant of KRAS. Here, I'm not going to tell you the exact uh, hit that we turned up. It's something that's proprietary. We're still developing this out, but I'm going to refer to it as SMKM. This is an enzyme that is involved in, in lipid metabolism. We now understand some of the uh, underlying biology. It's, it's pretty interesting how this uh, protein is, is really driving uh, the expression or the, the maintenance of expression in tumor cells. And we've seen when we knock out this factor that we can take mutant KRAS down specifically. And we've also shown in cell lines, and we now have uh, some really nice xenograph data as well, that you can induce a proliferation defect by knocking out this hit that we've identified. It is an enzyme. We're also able to drug it, and we're looking at that in vivo as well now. So we think this is a, a really interesting start to a, a program focused on, on KRAS mutants. And this is just one of our hits. There's, there's many others. And so we're really going to be building out a, a whole pipeline uh, of really interesting mutant KRAS biology here. So with that, I'll just turn to a, a slightly different type of screen that we've been doing focused on cytokine secretion in T cells. And there's a lot of reasons to want to, that one would want to modulate cytokine secretion. This is a driver of so many different types of, of disease pathology. And in particular, one uh, phenotype that we were interested in looking at is, is what happens uh, to intestinal stem cells during, for, or excuse me, for patients that, that have IBD. And IBD, you know, some consider it an inflammatory disease. Others have thought it may be more of an autoimmune type of, of disease, but irrespective of that, it's pretty clear that there are rogue T cells involved and T cells that are secreting cytokines and really destroying the intestinal stem cells. This has been looked at at the level of the intestinal cells to see if one could modulate that way, but we thought we would screen and look for factors that would allow us to take down T cell secretion. So to do this, we had to build a completely new phenotypic screening approach because we're gonna be looking at secretion. Rather than expression or modification, we had to be able to quantitate how much cytokine was being uh, spit out of, of the cell. So we were able to, to do that and developed a system where we basically catch the cytokines on the surface of the cell. And then we can use the same type of approach where we label with magnetic antibodies in order to sort cells based on levels of secretion. This gave us a really interesting set of hits. We focused on kinases here to, to really make sure that we walked away with something druggable, got a family of interesting hits. We're able to pull an off-the-shelf compound uh, to, to look at this, generated a model of IBD where we're feeding mice uh, dextran to uh, induce IBD and then looking to see if we can rescue with our compound. And the key result here, you can just kind of look at these images. The, the, if you look at the bottom set of images, there's these little brown dots. Those are the intestinal stem cells. You can see that if uh, we don't treat with DSS, we just treat with tap water, those stem cells are there. If you do induce IBD, they disappear. If we bring in our kinase inhibitor, we bring those intestinal stem cells back. So this is a really interesting way to, to modulate this disease pathology. It's protective of these intestinal stem cells. And we're also now expanding this to other, uh, other indications, uh, growth, uh, graft versus host disease, other things where T cell secretion is known to be implicated. Uh, so, and, and also we're moving on to, to doing lots of other secretion-based screens. And so finally, I'll just mention um, another effort that we have up and running. This is a collaboration with uh, Amgen, where we are helping them to develop cell lines that are super secretors of therapeutic antibodies. And uh, there are lots of, of really potentially very powerful therapeutic antibodies that are not yet available in the clinic because they're really hard to manufacture. It's really hard to get cells to secrete them so that they can be harvested and, and manufactured at scale. So we've teamed up with Amgen to use a, a secretion screening approach to find the drivers of secretion in, in the relevant models. Uh, we have some really great data um, and, and a really nice development effort in, in collaboration with Amgen. So that was just a very quick run through all of these uh, active areas and, and projects that we have within LeapFrog. Again, this is something that we're really interested in building out uh, at Northwestern. It teaches us a lot about biology but really points us right at uh, really interesting therapeutic targets and, and we're hoping to, to take those forward. 
So with that, I just want to uh, just point out that, you know, what we're really trying to get at here are the regulators of levels of disease driving proteins. And that's a slightly different approach than kind of the canonical targeting of small molecule or of active sites with small molecules or even antibody binders or blockers. And it's, it's really the, the principle that underlies everything that I just told you about. And then I just wanna particularly thank, uh, I have a great, great group of folks that uh, uh, were able to, to move this forward. Randy Atwal is a research assistant professor at Northwestern, who's really kind of chief in charge of this platform. Uh, Mahmoud Labib uh, developed all of our secretion-based screening technology, also research assistant professor and a really key member of our group. Gloria and Abdallah are two grad students that work on some of the projects I mentioned. And uh, thank you so much again for having me today. And hopefully I've left a, a few minutes for questions. Be happy to, to answer them. All right, Shana, thank you. And you did. Um, we have a couple minutes and be sure to put those in the Q&A uh, tool at the bottom of your screen. And just a beautiful combination of, you know, protein level uh, platform there to uh, grab cells and find uh, candidate drugs, tool compounds. It's just um, right on point. Thanks for the, being the lead off hitter today. And, um, you know, I'll just fire up with the first question here. You know, it's a, it's a broad platform and the, the mind goes races with uh, potential implementations. Are your plans, uh, what are your plans for growing it at Northwestern or perhaps as an independent startup, maybe not a, a drug focused, but a platform focused startup? Uh, do you have plans in that area? Uh, we're thinking through lots of different scenarios. It's, it is a platform, as you said, it's very broad. There's so many things that we can do with it. My feeling right now is that it doesn't necessarily belong within one company. I think we'd be kind of selling ourselves short if we just spun out a startup and, and parked it there. I would really love to see this capability grow and all of the programs that I just described grow at Northwestern. And then we can take them once the programs have kind of evolved into enough of a pipeline that maybe there's a startup in all of the areas to, to be done that, that I mentioned, that we can do that. Um, we've got to figure out how to resource it. That's something that I'm, I'm thinking through, but I think there's a huge amount of potential for uh, my group at Northwestern, for trainees at Northwestern, they kind of get a glimpse of what drug drug development can can look like. Um, and, and I think for the institution as well, it would be a, a great resource to grow. Um, yeah, and some, some of the um, platforms at Northwestern that have core facilities wrapped around them, 20, 30% of that activity is with private sector entities. Um, so uh, another questions are coming in now, hot and heavy. Uh, Chang Lee asks, can you use the platform to identify tumor neoantigens? And what is the sensitivity level? Great question. So we do have some proof of concept work where we're doing this through pulling uh, circulating tumor cells out of the blood, looking at what neoantigens they're carrying, and then taking that forward as a, a pipeline for neoantigen characterization. So you can absolutely adopt this for that <clears throat> application, and that's something that, that we're working on. Um, right. And so then, uh, Peter... Uh, <coughs> Do you see any neuroscience applications uh, for the platform? The yeah, great question. Autometry, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Absolutely. I mean, any disease phenotype that is molecular in nature, we can go after with this platform. So we just need to know, you know, what's the biological perturbation? What's happening in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, the molecular level that we can do screens and relevant models and, and try to find modulators of expression or modification or aggregation or whatever phenotype it is that's driving the, the disease biology. So would love to, to chat more with you about that at some point. Okay, all right. Well, so I'll do my best to field and transmit those questions to Shana offline, um, but we'll move ahead with our program. And thanks again, Shana, that was right on point. Thank you so much. Um, Pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, so next up, uh, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, uh, who's the Elizabeth Ward Professor and Director of the Center for Genetic Medicine at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. I now hand the floor over to Professor Elizabeth McNally. Uh, Beth, take it away. Thanks, Neil. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, it's uh, great to be able to present some of our work to everybody and to um, just tell you about how we're driving some using genetic signals to develop new protein biologics. 
there we go. So what I'm showing you here is a, a picture of two skeletal muscle cells, which are aligned across the screen. Um, skeletal muscle cells, individual cells are very, very long individual cells and the little divots that you see along the way are actually the individual nuclei. So they're very unique cells in that they are so long um, and they have this very important job of uh, producing muscle contraction and all the movement that we know, whether that's moving our arms and legs and walking or um, breathing. Um, the heart is a little bit different. It's of course my favorite muscle um, and the cells are a little shorter there and only have two nuclei, but fundamentally shares the same structure. And what you'll notice is that there's this beautiful striped pattern that appears, appears across the cells. And those represent attachment points between the muscle and the matrix that surrounds the muscle. And why this turns out to be so important is that mutations in many of these components, the attachment to the matrix around the muscle turns out to be really important because mutations in those genes lead to muscular dystrophy, which is fundamentally a breakdown of the muscle fibers. And so what I'm showing you here is if I were to do a cross section, so that same view that I just told you, if I were to cut it across, you'd see that the individual fibers nicely are all about the same size as each other. Those nuclei, the little purple spots are parked off to the periphery of each of those. But in the mildly dystrophic or the severely dystrophic muscle, what happens is, is the muscle effectively destroys itself. And it does so because the process of contraction actually begins to disrupt those muscle fibers. And the muscle fibers, while they have some regenerative capability, over time, it cannot keep up with that. And the muscle becomes replaced by scarring or fibrosis and fat, which are the big white blobs that you see in the severely dystrophic muscle. And we call that that fibro fatty infiltration it means that there's no more muscle fibers and so people become weak over time. And this is a particularly devastating disorder when it affects young children. Uh, the best known form is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is uh, affects boys because it's on the X chromosome. But there are more than 50 different types of muscular dystrophies. Many of these go by the name of limb girdle dystrophies. Um, but again, a wide genetic variety of what these different types of dystrophy are. And there's actually been a considerable interest in the part of uh, a lot of biotech and pharma right now because of our capacity now to do gene directed treatments. So whether that involves gene replacement using conventional gene therapy delivered by adeno associated viruses, or even now as people are um, doing preclinical work, doing genetic correction strategies using gene editing. And then of course there are approaches in between which go after the RNA by uh, exon skipping. So this has been a very interesting area uh, from a drug development perspective, because we've seen the first of these drugs um, make it into patients right now. And I have patients who are being treated by these drugs. Um, but our approach was a little bit different. Um, we've been a little bit daunted by the number of different genetic mutations and genes that can lead to muscular dystrophies. And so we took an approach to say, can we identify genetic modifiers that might act across many different forms of muscular dystrophy? And this work started many years ago using mouse models of muscular dystrophy, where we discovered genetic backgrounds that would make the mouse more uh, severe, have a more severe phenotype, and also genetic backgrounds that would render it more mild. And our measurements of severe and mild had to do with measuring how much disruption there was of the myofibers, which we can mark by how much Evans blue dye goes into fibers that converts itself very readily to a high throughput assay where we can actually measure how much dye is in each muscle. And we also measured how much scarring or fibrosis was present in the muscle using an assay, measuring how much hydroxyproline was present. And so doing these large genetic screens, we um, did genetic mapping and we used the power of genome-wide scanning to uncover genetic regions, which um, were capable of modifying the outcome of muscular dystrophy. Um, since we now have available you know, genome sequence and RNA sequence and many tools, we can more rapidly go from these chromosomal regions to the specific proteins that are genetically responsible for modifying muscular dystrophy. 
We're also keenly interested in identifying the mechanism of action of how each of these genetic modifiers exerts its effect to improve muscular dystrophies or muscle disease, because once we understand those mechanisms, we can then develop therapeutics around it. So our first hit using this approach, and again, this genetic screening platform, um, uh, was really important because it not only regulated the amount of injury to the individual muscle cells, but also the amount of scarring that was present. And it turned out to be a gene and protein known as LTBP4, which is latent TGF beta binding protein number four. So it took us right to the TGF beta pathway. Um, these LTBPs, which are latent TGF beta binding proteins, have now um, get, garnered some attention because they really represent a more novel approach towards regulating TGF beta activity. And we know TGF beta is involved in many different processes, not only muscle injury and repair, but also pulmonary fibrosis, uh, radiation response to injury, a lot of um, resistance to chemotherapeutics is also mediated by TGF beta pathways. So very important to understand this extracellular regulation of TGF beta. What it turned out to be was beautifully shown to us by the genetics, where um, there's a hinge portion of the molecule marked by the red arrow. And that hinge is a very interesting sequence, quite enriched with proline residues and a repeating proline motif. Um, and that hinge region was distinctly different between the two strains of mice where it had a large insertion or deletion, um, telling us exactly that it was the hinge region of the protein that was responsible for mediating the effect. And so once you have a hinge, you can begin to think about what the function is. And through a whole series of experiments, which I won't show you, the hinge turns out to be cleaved and it is the cleavage of the hinge region, which is directly associated with a conformational change in the protein and release of latent and then active TGF beta. And because we had such an obvious part of the protein that turned out to be important and, and a mechanism that said, oh, cleave this protein for its activity, one could very naturally begin to think about approaches to modulate that uh, pharmacologically and naturally thought about developing antibodies that would stabilize the hinge region and protect it from being cleaved. And so um, we did do this a number of years back. We did it with some very dirty polyclonal antibodies that um, seemed to work reasonably reasonably well, tested it in some mouse models. But of course, something like that is not going to become a therapeutic in patients. And so um, fast forward a number of years, um, we generated some high affinity human LTBP4 antibodies, again, directed precisely at that hinge region and conducted a series of experiments, both short and long-term studies and preclinical models of muscular dystrophy, demonstrating remarkable efficacy of these antibodies for their ability to protect, um, to stabilize the muscle membrane itself and to also protect against fibrosis. Um, so these, um, early, these studies were actually conducted uh, initially with a partnership with Solid Biosciences, but we've subsequently now uh, been pursuing it uh, through Ikeka Therapeutics, which is a company we founded. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the data using the human antibody injected into mice and showing what is an on-target um, activity. So even one day after injection, we can see the antibody localizing to that beautiful, very regular striped pattern, which is present within the myofibers. We can see the antibody uh, in this on-target position one day after injection into the animals. We see that same um, injection still showing very robust positioning within the animal muscle uh, seven days after injection, 14 days act after injection, and even as much as 21 days after injection from a single um, injection of the um, antibody. Um, these were experiments showing that the antibody also stabilizes the muscle membrane. This is a really wonderful assay, which has been developed by Alexis de Monbrun, who's an incredibly talented assistant professor who, with whom I've had the pleasure of working with over a number of years. Um, this is an assay where you can take out an individual fiber and zap it with a laser. And normally that induces a fair amount of damage, which is marked with fm 46 FM464, which is the red fluorescent dye. And so when we use a non-specific IgG antibody, you see there's quite a bit of red flu fluorescence indicative of a fair amount of damage having been induced by the laser. 
in the presence of the protective antibody, you see there's remarkably less Evans blue dye uptake because, I'm sorry, FM464 uptake, because what we've done is we've stabilized those myofibers by just the presence of the antibody. So it's really highlighting the fact that that genetic signal early on told us that this protein was important for stabilizing muscle membranes. And we can now see that in this um, ex vivo experiment using laser induced injury. Um, this is some of our in vivo data, um, which showed that if you, um, one of the ways you induce injury into a muscle is shown in the middle portion where you lengthen a muscle and you force the muscle to contract. And that's called a lengthened or eccentric contraction. It's very much equivalent to if you were walking downhill a lot, you're lengthening your muscles and contracting them. And anybody who does a lot of hiking knows that downhill actually causes your muscles to be a, a lot more sore afterwards. And so that's because it's quite injurious to the muscle. Um, we pre-treated a model of muscular dystrophy once weekly and then subjected the muscle to these eccentric contraction experiments. And the non-specific IgG antibody and the PBS injected animals lose almost half their force production over the course of several um, contractions. Whereas the presence of the SPI3H antibody to uh, LTBP4 um, terrifically protects almost half of the force loss that occurs in these muscles. So again, showing that we're stabilizing the muscle membrane. Um, we also showed in some long-term studies that the animals develop much less fibrosis in their muscles. We had two different antibodies, one called SBI3M and SBI3H. We made a mouse version of it as well as a human version of it because we weren't quite sure how well these would work in long-term studies, um, but it turned out both the human and the mouse worked well in the mouse. And this is looking at the amount of fibrosis that is present in diaphragm muscle, and it is remarkably produce, uh, reduced in the treated animals compared to PBS or the non-specific IgG control. Um, you can measure lung function uh, using what's called whole body plethysmography, um, and the measurement of lung function can be summarized using a statistic known as PEN-H. And so normally uh, muscular dystrophy mice uh, have abnormal pen H, elevated pen H measurements. And in the presence of the antibodies, uh, either the mouse or the human, we see uh, improved pen H parameters, which means that this diaphragm muscle is not only demonstrating less fibrosis, but it's also functionally much improved with better inspiration and expiration times. Uh, not quite at the normal control wild type levels, but um, approaching that. Um, we then combined this antibody with uh, the use of prednisone, which is a glucocorticoid steroid, which is used to treat uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients, not all muscular dystrophy patients, but Duchenne. Um, and what we found was the combination of prednisone plus the anti-LTBP4 antibody was again, even more protective than just the antibody on its own. And that's shown in the, the fourth column over where the force loss was now becoming um, to the point where it was not detectably different from wild type animals. So the combination of prednisone plus the LTBP4 antibody, again, improved um, the specific force loss to the level of what we saw in wild type animals. Um, so, We've been very excited about taking this antibody forward. Um, we've now secured some additional funding for doing this and um, we're moving forward with some uh, uh, new antibodies that we have now. Um, a second modifier locus that we've um, mapped, it turned out to be a protein called Anexin A6. And um, Anexin A6 is a completely different pathway this turns out to this genetic signal took us to this annexin A6, which is what turns out to be a resealing protein. And other annexins are actually well described for their role in modulating inflammation response. So annexins turn out to be very important when there is a marked increase in inflammation. Annexins help um, quiet down that inflammation. Um, this is again that laser assay shown to you in real time. So if uh, the red dot is where it was zapped with the laser. Um, and the red dot is actually a Nexin A6 that has been labeled with a TD tomato. And so it goes exactly to the region where the laser was and it forms what is a repair cap. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened to my slides. Perhaps we can get them back. <laughs> Are we rebooting or? 
Yeah, Tony should be able to bring that Sorry, back. Sorry, I think I, I think I killed us off with uh, yeah to, to, with movies. Oh, there, there we, we go. go. No, Thank no, you we're so good. much, Tony. Um, and this is just a non-moving cartoon that hopefully won't crash. And we'll show you the idea that an X and A6 is what forms the molecular band-aid or the cap right at the site of cellular injury. Um, and what's very interesting is you can produce this an X and A6 as a recombinant protein. And that recombinant protein um, can go right to the site again of muscle injury. So on the top part of the slides, is a muscle fiber that has been injured, but it's expressing an X and A6 from a plasmid inside the muscle. But on the lower part, showing you almost identical data, is that you can add recombinant purified an X and A6 protein from the outside of myofibers and get the exact same degree of protection. So in other words, you can add this protein from the outside. Um, you can also do the same thing in dystrophic fibers. What I showed you in the last slide was normal fibers. What I'm showing you in this slide is uh, from dystrophic animals. And it's that same idea that you can add it from the outside and protect those fibers from injury. So again, it turns out to be a very useful assay for us. Um, this was some in vivo data. Um, which is taking a model of muscular dystrophy that was injected with um, recombinant NX and A6. Uh, one of the biomarkers that leaks out of fibers when they are injured is a protein called uh, creatine kinase or CK. For example, if you go run a marathon and I measure your CK over the next couple of days, it's gonna be markedly elevated. Um, and what we showed is that the CK amount in these animals was reduced um, after their running effort because the recombinant and X and A6 was protecting those myofibers. Um, we did some 14 day dosing in these animals and again showed a reduction in the CK levels. And then on the right hand part of this slide is just showing you that the areas of injury look to be improved in the treated animals that received recombinant annex and A6. Um, so the modifiers that we've identified um, really act on overall cellular injury, inflammation, and fibrosis. It's perhaps not terribly surprising that that's what um, we might get when we're conduct conducting genetic modifiers um, because um, really what this disease is, is it's a disease of cellular injury. And so we identified TGF betas, we've identified annexins, uh, work from others has identified osteopontin. There's of course some interaction of these among these different uh, modifiers, but we also think that again, combinations of these might turn out to be very useful. One more forward. So our path to development, the anti-LTBP4 antibodies, which we've shown reduce latent TGF beta and its subsequent activation and reduce fibrosis. We really see this as an important approach towards um, as an anti-fibrotic. We're interested in muscular dystrophies. Again, we have Ikeka Therapeutics um, that has gotten this off the ground and gotten it going. We are looking for some additional investors because we're really quite keen on the idea that this can be used for additional fibrotic targets. And we have a whole series of antibodies and any number of them can be taken forward in different pathways that are involved in fibrotic disorders. Um, we're working on the recombinant annexin A6 project, and we've been doing that with Lakeside Discovery, which is a partnership with Deerfield Investments, and that's moving forward really well. And we've actually found some now additional uses for recombinant A6, both in the cardiac and um, neurodegeneration space that we think it will be useful there as well. So this is our ICACA leadership team. It involves me and Alexis de Monbrun, again, who's been terrific to work with, and our chief business officer, who may be known to some of you since she used to be at INVO, that's Dimitri Georgiathalou. And so she's been great to work with as well. And so with that, I think I have a couple minutes or a minute or two for questions. Right, yes, Beth, absolutely. We got several minutes here and um, I invite people to again, put questions into the Q&A tool. And um, yeah, I, just a beautiful example of uh, moving genetics into protein level biochemistry and that, that full arc of activity. Um, you know, for, the, for some of those loci that you came up with in the mouse model, um, do they map onto human 
GWAS signals or, you know, does the genetics uh, lead you to the same places in, in the human outbred population? Yeah, so for the first one, the LTBP4, there is absolutely a human signal. It's interesting because the polymorphisms that exist in humans are not in the hinge region. Um, they turn out to be outside of the hinge region of the molecule, but they act in the same way because they regulate how much TGF beta is actually binding to the protein and provide a very strong signal. And so those SNPs, because they do exert this powerful effect, actually take us to the other potential targets. It's not just muscular dystrophies. Um, it's also mm -hmm. some lung diseases and, again, radiation response um, and some other disorders that, again, tell us where to be thinking about applying this protein therapeutic. So we're pretty excited about that because the GWAS data is, in humans actually is pretty good. So. Um, right. Um, yeah. Okay. Here's here's one. Uh, is LTBP4 a TGF beta regulator only in muscle cells? How about other approaches introducing yeah. cleavage resistance uh, to retain TGF beta? Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Great ideas. So LTBP4 is fairly broadly expressed. It's um, it, it's in it's highly expressed in lung, for example, which is why we like lung and lung fibrosis as a target as well. But what is striking about it is that um, if you look in injury or you look in disease states, that's when sometimes you really see these LTBPs um, change their expression levels and go up quite a lot. And so it's how you get some specificity for using these things around the disease states. Um, some people know targeting the TGF betas themselves has proven difficult to do because you have to hit TGF beta one, two, three, and sometimes some of the other proteins. And, and for example, there, you know, even the pan TGF beta antibodies have not been very good. What's interesting is when you go after these LTBPs, you actually hit all of the TGF beta forms. So, you know, if one goes up or two goes up or three goes up of the TGF beta forms, you're getting all of them by going after the LTBP. Um, yeah, you could also think about um, protein resistant forms of LTBPs, which could be delivered in different mechanisms. It's a really right at the limit of what would fit within an AAV if you were thinking about a protein delivery that way. Um, the protein itself is a little bit large, um, but we're really interested in looking at whether you can use smaller forms of the protein and still use it as like a, a you know, sopping up extra TGF beta, but that's work ongoing. Yeah, great. Um, have, what is the mechanism, if you know it, of the hinge region, that proline repetitive region, um, it's cleavage. Uh, do we know what mediates that cleavage? Um, so our work so far has really just shown that it's um, just serine protease sensitive and any number of serine proteases, certainly in vitro can cleave the protein. Um, in vivo, we've been interested in the idea it might be certain MMPs, MMP2 or 9 that go up, but I doubt it's just one protein. And so that's why we haven't gone after the proteases themselves, because it seems like there's a wide variety of proteases that can do this, uh, many of which are, again, active during disease or injury states. Um, and so that's been, you know, we thought about it initially from a protease inhibitor standpoint, but uh, others have tried to prosecute that for some of these disorders and it's been a little bit difficult to do because not enough specificity going after the proteases themselves. Right. And um, there's one last one about just uh, to um, state that whatever you're willing to about the stage of the company or, um, and your interest in engagement. Um, yeah, we're first of all, we're delighted to talk to anybody about that. Um, we're very fortunate we've got enough. We um, uh, have now a whole series of new antibodies that we've generated ourselves as Icaca Therapeutics um, and that we did with an initial investor, but we're absolutely looking for other investors because again, now that we're getting additional leads, we'd like to take them forward in different indications. Um, we'll be able to take at least one forward be, because we actually did now receive some funding from NIH to be able to do this through a new and novel program through neurologic diseases and stroke, um, which will be helpful for taking one of those antibodies forward for one indication, but given the targets, we think this has a lot more indications than just one. So we'd be really happy to talk to anybody and I'm available to speak to people. Okay, and we can definitely find you online. Thanks so much, Beth. That was just, um, again, right on point. And thanks for your time this morning. Great, thank you. You bet. Um, so we'll move right on with the program um, at the top of the hour here. And I'll introduce the next speaker. Um, 
Uh, he's the director of the Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment, the Ruth and Evelyn Dunbar Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and a professor of neuroscience, pharmacology, and psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. And I'll turn the floor over to Peter Penzis. Um, Peter, take it away. Oh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for uh, including me in such, a, such an exciting and outstanding uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, this is a very, um, very exciting symposium so far. So um, um, as uh, Neil mentioned, uh, my name is Peter Penzas and I'm a professor at, uh, in uh, neuroscience at the medical school. My uh, laboratory um, focuses on uh, the biology of uh, synapses in the central nervous system. And uh, today I would like to talk to you to tell you a little bit about our recent work on uh, how we uh, harness this knowledge uh, we uh, gained on um, uh, synaptic biology and combined it with uh, pharmacological approaches to develop uh, new inhibitors for protein-protein interactions, specifically targeting uh, a, a protein that is highly enriched in synapses and is, and is involved in um, uh, transition to chronic pain. So uh, the goal of this work is to develop uh, novel um, first-in-class drugs uh, for the treatment of um, chronic neuropathic pain and other uh, uh, neurological conditions. Uh, do, do you guys he hear me? Yeah. Yes, and okay. I, see, I see and hear you. Yeah, Are the advancement of slides, is that clear? Uh, yeah, I, I got a sign here to unmute myself, but um, that may be, okay, fine. Yeah, uh, all good. All right, yeah. okay. So, um, uh, as uh, you all heard probably recently, as there's a lot of discussion about uh, opioids, that pain is a fairly, fairly common condition and affects um, about 10% of the population one way or another. And roughly pain can be classified as acute, uh, which uh, is uh, when an injury uh, causes an immediate uh, pain response. But this usually um, lasts only a relatively short period of time until uh, the injury is healed. But then in some cases, uh, a second step of pain uh, develops uh, and then there's a transition to this uh, chronic long-term uh, persistent form of pain, uh, which uh, is already largely disconnected from the original injury. And uh, in many cases, this uh, long-term pain is neuropathic pain because it's either amplified uh, or generated within the central nervous system, either in the dorsal horn or the horn of the spinal cord or in the brain or both. So, uh, Unfortunately, uh, current analgesics are ineffective in, in about 50% of patients with uh, chronic neuropathic pain. And, uh, but we have learned um, a lot about the neurobiology underlying um, chronic neuropathic pain over the past decade or so. And uh, uh, it's been established that transition from acute to chronic pain involves the formation and enlargement of uh, synapses on um, excitatory neurons in the spinal cord and in the brain. So these uh, new synaptic uh, connections are formed on these structures called dendritic spines. So sometimes I'm going to refer to them as dendritic spines or synaptic spines, and they can be visualized uh, easily, but they are the sites of synapses in the brain. So the idea here is that multiple, uh, 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 repeated stimulation from the original uh, pain uh, stimulus results in uh, induction of plasticity uh, in which uh, more synapses or stronger synapses are formed, which is able to amplify or to regenerate and maintain that pain signal. So um, we have uh, discovered a pathway that includes a protein called calorie. Which is, a small, which is a guanine nucleotide exchange factor or a GAF for the small GTPase RAC1, which is a, a small GTPase uh, 
that is involved in a number of biological processes, but it's a main regulator, a very important regulator of uh, actin cytoskeletal remodeling and cellular remodeling. And uh, this protein calorine is downstream of uh, several uh, important synaptic receptors, which have been involved in, uh, uh, in uh, pain uh, genetically and also pharmacologically. So work from uh, other laboratories, uh, we have shown that calorine and this pathway is uh, very important for formation of new synapses and new dendritic spines um, in the central nervous system. Work from other laboratories have shown that calorine and this pathway is actually upregulated during the transition from acute to chronic pain and uh, is responsible for induction of these uh, uh, dendritic spines and these multiple new connections and neurons. On the contrary, uh, uh, work from several other labs in several mouse models has shown that inhibition of calorine by knockdown or knockout results in, um, in uh, analgesia at the same time with uh, prevention of formation of these dendritic spines. So calorine uh, involves a new pathway, a new target, and uh, is, is something that's independent and uh, different than opioids. Uh, and it targets uh, not cellular surface receptors, neurotransmitter receptors or uh, calcium channels, but it targets uh, structural remodeling of synapses. So we reasoned that uh, we hypothesized that uh, inhibiting calorie could achieve the same effects, could block the transition from chronic, uh, from acute to chronic pain by blocking the formation of these new synapses in the CNS. And uh, that would be a uh, first in class drug because this class of proteins have not been targeted before and um, would be a non opioid uh, drug uh, that could be further developed uh, to treat pain. So uh, let me tell you a few things about uh, calorie itself and why we think that it's a, it's a good uh, drug target. So uh, first of all, calorie expression is highly restricted to uh, excitatory neurons in the CNS. So this panel shows uh, 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 how uh, an expression of uh, calorie mRNA, and you can see here, uh, it's, it's most highly expressed in excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons in the CNS, and very, very low expression level in other tissues. So if we have a, a drug that's selective for calorie, uh, the, the localization of the substrate would increase the specificity. Calorin within neurons is also very, very highly enriched in uh, these dendritic spines, in these synaptic spines, as is shown here by these white dots along the dendrites. So even at the cell, subcellular level, calorin is exactly uh, concentrated at the sites of um, action where we want the drug to act. Uh, biologically, uh, calorin uh, regulates the number and the size of uh, these synaptic side, uh, spines. So when we overexpress calorine, we get uh, uh, in neurons uh, these larger and more dendritic spines. And when we knock down calorine, which would be similar to its inhibition, we uh, lose spines. We, we cause spines to shrink, uh, synaptic spines, and uh, to disappear. So by modulating calorine activity, we hypothesize that we could be able to modulate um, the number of uh, synaptic spines on neurons. So in conclusion, calorine acts through a novel mechanism of action and it's different, which is different from the current pain drugs. Uh, I'm going to present here several studies from other laboratories that validate calorine as a target in pain. So first, um, calorine expression is highly upregulated, is induced and highly upregulated in the spinal cord uh, in several models of uh, pain. So for example, here we have uh, surgical uh, pain, post-surgical pain. Uh, we have um, uh, neuropathic pain model, and then we have a diabetic pain model uh, in, in rodents. And in all of these cases, uh, the initial uh, noxious stimulus causes a long lasting upregulation of uh, calorie that lasts uh, you know, up to weeks. Conversely, knockdown or knockout of calorie in all these models results in a, a, a reversal of, uh, or a prevention of uh, the induction of this um, uh, long-term uh, pain uh, and sensitivity response. 
So again, this shows that targeting Kelrin could um, interfere with the induction with the transition to uh, long-term pain. And uh, one of the models that's commonly used for testing, uh, um, uh, initial testing of uh, uh, efficacy in pain is the uh, formalin injection model. And uh, in this model, uh, Kelrin also, uh, knockdown of Kelrin also prevents um, induction of uh, hypersensitivity by uh, formalin induction. And this is a model that we are going to use uh, later for testing drugs. So in conclusion, Kelvin is upregulated and it's necessary for the establishment of long-term pain in various uh, rodent models. So um, based on this, uh, we set out to discover a novel small molecule inhibitors of uh, the protein-protein interaction between Kelvin and Rec1. And I would like to uh, just say a few words about the mechanism uh, here. So Kelrin is, as I mentioned, a gluon nucleotide exchange factor. So in a way it's an enzyme, but, uh, but uh, its mode of action is through uh, modulating protein-protein interactions. And uh, by, uh, by removing uh, the GD, practically physically removing the GDP bound on, uh, on RAC1 after hydrolysis of GTP. So, in our, um, our rationale was to target this uh, interaction and in particular to develop uh, uh, some small molecule compounds that bind specifically to Kelrin and not to REC, but it's pre it, they prevent uh, the interaction of REC with Kelrin. So we uh, did a computer simulation uh, in silico screen with 65 million structures against uh, the structure of uh, this uh, GAF enzymatic domain and in particular, we found a pocket which is highly conserved, uh, highly divergent and, and specific for Kelrin among the other uh, GAF family members. And um, we found about a hundred hits and then we tested them in an in vitro GAF assay and uh, uh, we got one hit, which is our probe compound. And then we went on and uh, validated this compound uh, further in, um, uh, in vitro and cellular assays. And uh, uh, in a, in a GAF, in vitro uh, GAF non, uh, uh, activity assay, uh, the compound uh, uh, had a dose, dose response inhibition on calorie. The IC50 here is, uh, looks very small um, or, or uh, large, uh, 85 micromolar, which is not uncommon for first hits in protein-protein uh, interaction inhibitors. But I would like, would like to say that the second generation compounds we already have are, uh, have a EC50 of uh, two to 30 micromolars, so they are much uh, more improved. Um, these compounds are also, uh, PP1 or this inhibitor is able to inhibit uh, neuronal activity in uh, cultured rat neurons as uh, expected, and as shown by inhibitors of RAC1. So then uh, we tested uh, some early uh, safety and bioavailability and uh, uh, pharmacology uh, properties of uh, PP1. So PP1 is not toxic to cells uh, in uh, heterologous cells or to neurons. When we incubate neurons uh, with uh, PP1, uh, it, it inhibits their activity, but then we, we can wash it out and uh, neuronal activity returns to normal. Uh, it is a blood brain barrier where injected uh, intraperitoneally, blood ba brain barrier permeable, uh, although this can be improved and doesn't seem to be. Uh, hepatotoxic, at least in this assay. So uh, next we tested um, uh, in vivo efficacy in the pain model, in the formalin pain, mo pain model. And uh, in this particular case, uh, we used tramadol, which is a synthetic opioid that's commonly used um, in surgeries uh, as, a, um, as a control. And I would like to point out here that uh, tramadol was used intraperitoneally but uh, we used um, PP1 intratically just because we didn't know yet the uh, blood brain barrier permeability and the pharmacokinetic uh, properties. So, and we just wanted to make sure that it hits the nervous system. But uh, in uh, any case, we found, uh, we got a dose response dependent, uh, dose dependent response uh, of uh, inhibition of uh, uh, the pain response in this, um, formal in model uh, indicating that uh, the, the, um, this 
chemical structure backbone uh, is a promising uh, uh, target for future development uh, to treat uh, uh, pain. So uh, the way we envision to move forward with this is um, uh, to develop a treatment for a, a patient group uh, that uh, is, uh, uh, in, uh, first we would focus on uh, patients with moderate to severe chronic post-surgical pain. And post-surgical pain is one of the indications, one of the mouse models that uh, uh, calorie, in, uh, where calorie knockdown seem to be beneficial. Um, also in this case, uh, the drug can be given before the surgery and can be given all along the period following the surgery uh, to prevent transition to long-term uh, or chronic pain. We would select patients that are not responsive to the standard of care, gabapentin, pregabalin, duloxetine, or a combination of these, and also patients who are susceptible to opioid addiction. First, uh, we would start this as a monotherapy, and then we would look for options for opioid sparing uh, therapy. Um, other potential pain uh, indications could be diabetic neuropathy, uh, spinal cord injury, uh, chemotherapy-induced uh, neuropathic pain, and all, in all of these cases, uh, the drug can be uh, administered early. And uh, some of these have been implicated by animal models uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the calorie pathway. Uh, target engagement in clinical trials could be measured by uh, PET ligands of synapse density. There are various methods to assess synapse density and binding to synapses. Then we can assess um, uh, the substrate uh, activity rack or PAC uh, from uh, the CSF using ELISA with a, a commercial antibody. And then in clinical trials, surrogate markers would be conventional pain markers that are used uh, conventionally in, um, in uh, such clinical trials. Uh, I would like to uh, say a few words about the market. So the neuropathic pain market is uh, the most valuable segment of the pain indications. It's valued currently at 10.8 billion, and it's uh, expected to grow to 25 billion. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, about 10% of the population are affected by pain, and uh, about half of those don't respond properly or, or um, uh, to the current medication. So our target would be this group of non-responders. And here, there's a great uh, unmet need. So. Um, uh, there's a need for uh, efficacious analgesics uh, for these non-responders based on new targets and uh, new mechanisms of uh, action um, and uh, which have uh, reduced risk of addiction. So that creates a great opportunity for novel therapeutic classes based on better understanding of pain pathophysiology, which uh, we are applying. So currently uh, in, uh, in the, uh, for Chronic, uh, neur chronic neuropathic pain, uh, the drugs on the market are either, the main drugs are either anticonvulsants like pregabalin and uh, uh, gabapentin uh, or uh, uh, SNRIs uh, like duloxetine and, uh, and uh, amitriptyline. But these are, as I said, only partially effective. Uh, opioids uh, are effective early on, but um, uh, they are prescribed less and less because of their risk of chemical dependence. So in this case, our uh, drug would be a no would target a novel target, would uh, involve a novel mechanism of action, likely non-addictive, and uh, uh, specifically target central pathways. So we filed a patent, a provisional patent on this uh, these drugs, um, and we're planning to develop them further. And this is uh, the, the development um, uh, plan, the Gantt chart, and um, so we went through the hit identification stage, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, currently we have a number of analogs related and unrelated to each other with EC50s between two and uh, 35 uh, micromolar. And our goal is to improve these to an EC50 of 100 nanomolar to one micromolar, which is well in the range for uh, lead compounds uh, for inhibition of protein-protein interaction. And then uh, we have all of these assays uh, in place so we can uh, implement um, uh, the lead optimization immediately. And our goal is to, within uh, a year, a year and a half, to uh, proceed to IND enabling study. So um, to help with this, we established a company, uh, Synaptomed, 
uh, with a goal of developing uh, novel small molecule drugs to treat, treat human disorders by targeting small G protein signaling pathways. And beyond calorine, uh, there are 60 members of the GAF family uh, only for rack and row, uh, and they are involved in uh, several neurological conditions and uh, in many cancers and many other conditions. So if we could uh, leverage our knowledge gained uh, by targeting calorine, we can develop compounds that specifically target uh, these other GAFs and uh, uh, in, for different indications. Uh, uh, I am the leader of the company uh, with experience in uh, small GTPAs, uh, biology and synaptic biology. And I work with uh, uh, Ewan, a research assistant professor uh, who uh, is a translational biochemist who has worked in drug discovery before. We are advised by an excellent team of experts in, uh, in uh, entrepreneurship, in uh, uh, pain and venture capital. And uh, thank you very much. All right, <clears throat> Peter, thanks so much for that. And um, there's the, the chat is hot uh, with some Q&A here. So let me get right to it. Um, Eleonora Gatta asks, you know, hi, Peter. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Can you comment on what you think would be best timing to administer the drug in terms of preventing the new spines from forming? Hi, Elnora, thank you for the question. So uh, one indication could be um, surgery, uh, post-surgical pain. And uh, in this case, uh, the drug could be administered even a week before surgery and administered uh, following uh, uh, for several weeks uh, following surgery. And uh, that would uh, already prevent the system from uh, uh, undergoing spinogenesis, but what would also um, prevent this transitional uh, uh, period to chronic pain uh, where spine formation is, is um, very important. Uh, that would be, a, or for example, in diabetic uh, pain, the earlier, the better. In, in all of these conditions, the earlier, the better uh, would, be, would be the best. Yeah, fascinating to think about a, a new, not a mode of action, but also new administration timings. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, from Trevor Allred, we've got, uh, would calorin down uh, regulate an, or an inhibitor need to be applied prior to significant neuronal differentiation to demonstrate an optimal effect in pain reduction. Yeah, so sort of similar thread, but uh, go ahead with Trevor's question. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, again, I think uh, uh, starting the treatment earlier before the surgery or before the injury would probably be the best or maybe deliver, the drug could be delivered at the same time with, with the surgery uh, and uh, uh, that probably would be would have the highest chance of preventing uh, formation of new synaptic connections. Great, I'm duty bound to the next question. It's uh, from Irv Goldberg, um, who for years at Northwestern was dedicated to making a male pill, a male <laughs> version of the pill. Irv asks, uh, what do you predict in terms of uh, duration of action, a loss of drug sensitivity, or potential for addiction and side effects. So he's sort of interested in the dark matter of this treatment modality. Uh, so in our early studies, uh, it looks like some of the newer compounds, uh, uh, their effects last uh, at least a week after one incubation. And these are in vitro studies. So, um, and, and they stick pretty well to, to neurons and the effects are fairly long lasting. So that would actually be good because uh, uh, if that was the case, uh, we would, uh, and if the drug had to be administered uh, uh, by injection, uh, that would make delivery uh, easier, uh, more manageable. Uh, on the second uh, side, addiction, um, actually uh, there are several uh, papers uh, showing that uh, inhibiting calorie actually uh, prevents uh, uh, transition to um, addiction in uh, for cocaine and uh, amphetamine. So, because that process also involves new synapse formation. Mm. So it seems like, uh, you know, we get uh, that added beneficial effect of, uh, you know, being 
sort of anti-addictive, but it of course has to be validated. Yeah, the, the chat is hot. So I'm going to go an extra one or two minutes here and, and we'll extend Sam's time uh, uh, properly after this. Um, so Chang Li asks about um, concerns around neurodegeneration. So similar thoughts as Irv. And then I've got one more quick question as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, we made knockout mice, full knockout mice and uh, uh, of Calvin and the heterozygote mice have... Uh, very mild phenotypes. The homozygote mice uh, also don't have uh, embryonic lethality, uh, grow, up, uh, grow up well. They have uh, deficits in working memory and uh, also some impairments in, uh, in um, uh, fear uh, memory, um, hyperactivity, and these are all the, the heterozygote mice, the homozygote mice. Uh, we don't see uh, uh, even long-term memory deficits. We don't see neurodegeneration, uh, even in older mice. So we do expect some uh, side effects uh, related to cognitive function. But uh, in a way, um, having a therapeutic window that's well-defined around uh, you know, before and just after the surgery, uh, where we could administer this this drug would also minimize that period uh, of uh, you know interference with um, with you know basic cognitive processes. So even though during that time uh, uh, you know maybe the side effects would be bothersome, uh, but if the drug can be discontinued after a month or two, uh, and uh, you know cognition would return to normal. Uh, that wouldn't be uh, so so unmanageable. Um, okay, maybe uh, since he sneaked one in from from Jay Olson here, last one, um, and then I'll convey the rest, Peter, by uh, textual means. Oh, sure, but, thank you. Yeah, uh, sure. Jay Olson asks, you know, any potential applications in epilepsy? I know Rick Silverman's very active and inspired by that area. Um, any have you thought through uh, your target in terms of epilepsy? Yes, we have actually, because um, what we found, uh, this genetic, genetic link. link the, there's, the, oh. <laughs> you got a little uh, feedback. There's, sorry, there's oh. a bit of feedback. Uh, there is no genetic link uh, with epilepsy, but uh, the pathway that Kelvin is involved in is linked to epilepsy. And the, the effects on uh, cultured neurons, uh, on uh, network activity and synchrony seem to be consistent with, uh, you know, an anti-epileptic drug. So that is actually a, a very open possibility. And uh, uh, once we have a more efficient, a more efficacious compound with like a, an EC50 of uh, 0 0.1 to 1 micromolar, we are going to test it in, uh, in um, uh, epilepsy models as well. We have some genetic epilepsy models that we want, we would like to test, uh, test them in. Okay. All right, Peter, thanks so much for the extended time. I guess I'm drunk with power here and <laughs> having the <laughs> great. The thank you very much. Delay. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, to progress the questions, we'll get to you. And sorry for those questioners uh, I couldn't get to. But next, um, you're, you're, you're glad you stayed. Uh, this is our uh, fourth and last of Northwestern professors. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the next uh, professor. He's a board of trustees, professor of material science, chemistry, medicine, biomedical engineering, and director of the Simpson Query Institute at Northwestern. I give to you the Honorable Sam Stuff. Sam. Thank you, uh, Neil, for the invitation uh, to be here, uh, to your team as well, and in the introduction. So I'm going to tell you about uh, supramolecular peptide medicines. And uh, so the first thing uh, that I will do is uh, basically show you a visual of what we mean by um, uh, a supramolecular structure. Uh, here we have um, basically a visual uh, of many molecules self-assembling into a fiber-like structure. And in the Stoop Lab over the years, we have uh, actually uh, developed uh, many different kinds of supramolecular structures, including uh, some that have a single molecule, others that have 
uh, sev uh, several molecules in them, as the ones you are seeing animated here in the slides. And so basically, uh, we can craft uh, molecular structure of the monomers in these structures and then render them with function. So uh, in this next slide, then I just summarize quickly what we mean by supermolecular structure. They are uh, effectively uh, uh, structures that undergo supramolecular polymerization and they can have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of molecules. They're very, very different from polymers uh, and their formation is driven by self-assembly. Uh, the bonds between the molecules are, are secondary, which means that the structures are in principle reversible and they can be biodegraded very easily. So they are a wonderful uh, source uh, of um, uh, ideas for uh, therapeutics. Uh, their dynamic behavior, their internal dynamic behavior, as you'll see at the end of my talk, uh, based on a very recent discovery uh, that was published less than a year ago, uh, we have now appreciated that uh, the dynamics in, in, of these internal dynamics of these supramolecular structures can uh, affect uh, strongly their bioactivity. And there are many different potential uh, applications and therapies that could be developed with them, including regenerative medicine, uh, the targeting of therapies and, and cell culture and delivery of cells, uh, and, and even gene therapy. So it's a very broad space uh, to work with. Now, specifically with supramolecular peptide medicines, now the monomers of these structures are largely peptides, even though they can also have glycans as well and nucleic acids, but uh, the main structure, uh, at least for this subject of this talk are peptides. And so what we can do with them is amplify protein signaling or we can even replace the use of a protein uh, as a therapy uh, and still using the same bioactive peptide that would be used in biology. Uh, but now you have a structure with thousands of molecules that has a much longer half-life and probably a lower production cost uh, than a protein. So they can also store molecules internally, uh, small molecule drugs, but that now you can use the actual monomers, which are peptides, to uh, integrate uh, receptor agonists or antagonists. Uh, and uh, you can also use those peptides to target the therapy to a specific tissue. Uh, and for example, uh, as indicated at the bottom, we are now uh, very interested in designing them to deliver nucleic acids. So I'm gonna very uh, rapidly uh, go through this uh, since there isn't a lot of time, uh, showing you some examples of their use in regenerative medicine. I'll give one example of a systemic targeted therapy. And then I'll end with this very recent discovery on supramolecular motion, which is a real uh, game changer for supramolecular medicines. So uh, the, in this slide, you see a visual uh, of, the, uh, of the peptide uh, monomers assembling into a cylindrical nanofiber. They're, the molecules are called peptide amplophiles, and they consist of a peptide segment uh, that is covalently bonded to an alkyl tail. And this alkyl tail uh, is very important to drive the self-assembly of the system in water uh, so that a fiber can form. Uh, you can, uh, in fact, uh, basically design uh, internally the peptides uh, with you know, many, many permutations, as you can imagine. One of our favorite ones is designing that purple domain that you see on, this, on the movie uh, to form be beta sheets internally so that it can drive the supramolecular polymerization. So uh, in... In, 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 in summary here, uh, you can have a gallery of, you know, literally hundreds or thousands of different types of monomers that you can design for specific uh, purposes. And the typical design includes something bioactive at the very terminus of the molecule, which then ends up being displayed uh, to cells uh, when the system is used as a therapy. And I'm going to illustrate that in a minute with a specific system. Here you see a cryo-electron micrograph of the nanofibers. 
the supramolecular structures. And as you can see, they have very uniform diameters. And uh, when you concentrate them uh, to a high enough level, then you can, in fact, create a hydrogel, for example, and localize the bioactive uh, element uh, in a specific uh, compartment uh, of the organism. Or if they're more dilute, then, then they can be injected systemically and be targeted to a specific location. Uh, they can have many different morphologies. This one it happens to be a twisted uh, type of uh, supramolecular structure. And you see the cross section looks more like a stadium rather than a circle. And there's a lot of, there's a, there's a very uh, rich space of morphology that can be designed. So this slide illustrates how we signal uh, the cells, right? So this fiber that you see here in red, that has these yellow clusters that are displayed on its surface because they are in the terminus of the peptide. And then those are the structures that can talk to receptors. And the, the red background uh, would be made up of a second molecule that does not have any bioactivity, but then allows you to dilute the signal and then use the signal density as a way to tune the required bioactivity. And sometimes uh, when we design uh, systems, we basically, as you see here on the right, uh, now a system where there is an actual protein that's bound to the peptide that sticks out, the peptide segment that sticks out, and, and so we can develop uh, therapies uh, through, with the use of proteins, not only uh, through the use of bioactive peptides that are themselves the agonist or the antagonist. And so as you see in the upper uh, part of the slide, uh, the self-assembly here is uh, revealing uh, the, that uh, green uh, color uh, peptide segment, which is designed to bind a specific protein. We've been extremely successful with uh, two proteins in particular, BMP2 and TGA-beta, uh, which are, as everyone knows, uh, extremely important in biology in many different ways. So uh, the first success we had with regard to bioactivity was in back in 04, where we showed that a nanofiber with the pentapeptide IKVAV displayed at the terminus and uh, this is a peptide segment that is derived from laminin-1, uh, was able to turn, uh, well, it was able to uh, take neural stem cells into a pure population of neurons without any glial cells, uh, without the use of any proteins. So, uh, but it was important that at least half of the molecules in the assembly of thousands of molecules had this particular epitope that activates uh, integrin beta one. And this led to the differentiation of the neural stem cells into neurons. And uh, this has been used now by many people and validated in many ways. In this uh, next slide, you see what probably is going to be the first clinical product that we will uh, push forward. Uh, we have established a company called Amphix Bio, and, and this is one of the first targets. And this utilizes the, uh, as you see on the left, the red segment, a peptide that binds specifically BMP2. This uh, binding of BMP2 by the nanofibers formed by this molecule has the, the amazing effect that it reduces by a hundredfold and actually now increasing, increasing in, in newer formulations beyond 100, the amount of protein that is necessary to induce spinal fusion uh, during spinal fusion surgery. You see there the three animal models. Uh, and at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a movie that sort of tells you how we can formulate the material. Uh, in this particular case, it's formulated as a toothpaste-like structure and you put it between two posterior lateral processes of the spine, and eight weeks or so later, you have uh, the vertebrae fully fused with authentic bone, a very healthy bone. And, and the remarkable thing is that right now in the clinic, uh, in a famous product uh, called Infuse, made by Medtronic, uh, you, can, you, you require about 1,500 micrograms of recombinant BMP2 to fuse uh, the spine. And in the porcine model, 
uh, with very similar sizing there to us, uh, with 50 micrograms, we can achieve full fusion. So we're very excited about this because it, it, this will um, uh, create many novel opportunities on therapies where bone regeneration is critical uh, using uh, BMP2 as the driver for osteogenic differentiation. So uh, in this next slide, I show you a more recent example uh, where we targeted a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a protein that, of course, uh, many people would love to use as a therapy, in, uh, especially for the CNS. And, uh, but this is, of course, very difficult because of the very short half-life, the production costs, et cetera. But developing this um, uh, peptide amplophile, which at the terminus uh, displays the cyclic peptide uh, that uh, was actually identified in an earlier paper back in 2006, uh, we were able to uh, create the supramolecular structure that actually um, uh, activates the receptor to uh, BDNF, which is track B. You see in the Western blot at the bottom of the slide, how the, the lane uh, for DNF, of course, you expect to see the phosphorylated receptor, but the BDNF mimetic peptide amplifier is equally competent at uh, turning on the receptor. You see the presence of the phosphorylated track B. What's interesting here is if you look at the Western uh, in back in the lane towards the left where, you, where we've used just the BDNF mimetic peptide, and we basically have no receptor activation. So what this basically indicates is that the supramolecular structure is the therapy. So it's not the, the mimetic peptide itself. It is actually the collection of thousands of molecules uh, producing this filamentous structure that is very much capable of activating receptors and being highly bioactive. One illustration of systemic therapy in this next slide, uh, this is work that uh, we did back in 2015, uh, but uh, we now have several uh, of these targets, but I only chose to just talk about this one. Uh, and, uh, but in this particular case, the molecule that uh, we developed uh, was, uh, you see it at the top, at the terminus, it has a peptide sequence that recognizes collagen. So we thought we could use this to target the fibers to uh, an area uh, that where we have simulated the placement of a stent. Uh, as you know, in stents, which is a sort of critical medical procedure, uh, there is the problem of, uh, uh, of, of uh, hyperplasia following the procedure because uh, you get a, a sort of uncontrolled proliferation of smooth muscle cells. And uh, a one specific way to address this problem is to, is to introduce as a therapy nitric oxide. So as you can see here in the top of in the chemical structure, we did nitrosylation of cysteine to carry nitric oxide, which is a therapy. We use the peptide segment at the terminus to target the therapy. And as you will see in the next slide, first of all, we were able to, in a model where we uh, did balloon angioplasty of the left carotid artery, and you see with the, the through, via the fluorescence that's in the molecules, in some of the molecules, that we are able to target this specifically to the left carotid artery where the angioplasty was carried out. So, so this is a very a vivid example of our ability to target therapies uh, that are used systemically to a specific region. And in this case, we delivered nitric oxide and this completely suppressed, as you can see in the upper part of the slide, you can see how we uh, were able to suppress you know, intimal hyperplasia with this therapy uh, and to target it to the specific site where it was needed. Okay, so we have, as I said a minute ago, many different examples of targeted therapies of this sort. Uh, and, and we are very interested, for example, in arteriosclerosis and other targets. Uh, and it is an active uh, area in, in my lab at the moment. So I'm gonna finish up with this, uh, uh, something that is relevant to the central nervous system, which is you know, one of my passions right now. 
and um, in developing therapies for the brain and the spinal cord. And this, uh, what I will show you is something that is uh, based on a paper we published uh, last November. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and I will proceed to tell you what the science behind it, it is. So in, in this work, uh, uh, we basically sh uh, sh saw that if we using pep the peptide sequence control the internal motion of the molecules that are in the filamentous uh, supramolecular medicine, then we can change drastically their ability to signal receptors. And we have tested this in in vitro models and also in in vivo models. Now, the, the reason why this science is important is because if you think about receptors, which are always the, tar the targets of, of our therapies, they're moving around very rapidly on the cell membrane. And so we reason that given that our molecules are bonded non-covalently to each other, that we could have the ability to tune exactly how intensely they move inside. And so because the receptors are moving targets, if the molecules of the therapy are also moving, then we would increase the probability that they would meet up with a successful contact to uh, trigger signaling pathways. So in, in, the, in, in one example in vitro, for example, we have seen that we took embryonic human neural stem cells, differentiated them in, into neurons, but the, the striking effect here, as you see at, on the left side of the slide, is that when the motion inside the, the fiber, the supramolecular medicine is very slow, you see very little differentiation of the neural stem cells uh, into neurons. When that motion is faster uh, via the mutation of two amino acids in the sequence, now we begin to see uh, the presence of neurons appearing uh, from the, the neural stem cells. You see them in white, uh, the neurons, they're very obvious in terms of their, their morphology. Then we proceeded to test this in, in, in vitro, uh, in vivo, in a model of spinal cord injury, where we sought out to uh, uh, test the therapy uh, in the spinal cord after a severe injury, uh, a paralyzing severe injury in the mouse model. And, and so as you can see here, uh, the idea was that uh, we would uh, think about a severe injury to the spinal cord uh, uh, when there is uh, paralysis and for example, an acute injury. I mean, it, it could also of course be a chronic injury, but the idea was, could we inject that supramolecular medicine right at the site of injury and have a beneficial effect on, on um, uh, as a bioactive therapy that could address paralysis. Okay, so here you see what we did in this particular work. We use two signals. We use the IKBAV signal, which is laminin derived, and this one activates beta-1 integrin, and we knew that from before. Uh, but we also introduce another signal, which is FG, the FGF2 mimetic that you see as signal two. So instead of using FGF2 as a protein, we are now using 10 mole percent in this uh, supramolecular fiber as the bioactive um, uh, peptide, which uh, turns on, uh, activates the FGF2 receptor. As you know, the FGF2 is a fantastic signal. It, it is mitotic, it can be angiogenic. In the spinal cord, you know, there, some people believe that it, it can change the phenotype of astrocytes. And so it was a very good choice. And so what you're gonna see uh, next is we tested two systems in which we had the same concentration of signals, IKVAV and FGF2, the same um, uh, uh, density of signals, uh, same morphology, same physical properties, but we, we, we basically mixed uh, the, in the sequence that you see on the upper left side is a sequence for motion control. So if we cross those two to be different uh, for the two signals that we're interested in, we could then activate very fast motion of the molecules uh, in, 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 in these systems. And in fact, uh, this was uh, very much uh, detected, detected by uh, fluorescence depolarization uh, 
predicted by computer simulation and also by NMR. And so you see here in this slide, you know, histology after the injury to the cord and, and you see fast motion and slow motion. And you see uh, that the axons, the dashed line is the midline of the injury. And you see how axons extend beyond the site of injury uh, quite a ways actually, but only in when we localize the nanofibers, the supramolecular structures at the site of injury and uh, when, where molecules have very intense motion. When the motion is slow, you don't see those axons extended beyond the uh, regenerated axons beyond the site of injury. Uh, very excitingly, when you look at the histology in the cross section of the spinal cord, you see the formation of, uh, of very, uh, you know, all functional blood vessels. Uh, and only when the FGF2 signal uh, has fast motion, when this, the motion is to, uh, toned down, then there is much less blood vessel formation in the spinal cord. In this um, uh, final slide, before my conclusions, I show you just a visual of the two signals, one signal in green, one signal in orange, and uh, comparing basically two supramolecular medicines, one moving very fast, one moving very slow. Over on the right, there's the computational prediction that we've done. And then uh, if, if you see in the, um, uh, at the bottom of the screen, this is the phenotype of the paralyzed mouse dragging its hind limbs. Uh, when we uh, basically uh, in introduce the therapy, then four weeks after the injection uh, of the slow moving molecules, uh, uh, now we see some recovery in the hind limb mobility, but not very much, but you know, strikingly, uh, when we use the nanofibers with a very fast motion, you get really remarkable functional recovery and the animal can, can walk really nicely uh, as a result of the uh, supramolecular motion. I think this is uh, something that's really gonna change uh, our ability to uh, design very effective therapies, uh, bioactive therapies that could replace at least some of the protein therapies and uh, we are very much looking forward to, uh, to doing that. So in the way of conclusions, I, I hope you've appreciated what a supramolecular medicine is. It's an exciting platform because you can multiplex signals. You can also use the information to target specific tissues. So this is not like in the, in the messenger RNA vaccine or in doxorubicin therapies where you use lipids and things like that to encapsulate the biologic or the drug. Here, the, the vehicle itself is the drug, and, and there can be more than one for targeting uh, for different, for several signals. And, and we can, you know, still de deliver along the way proteins. Uh, they could be antibodies, they could be uh, just regular proteins and, and, uh, or even uh, nucleic acids. The, the big advantage of, of this platform is which of course biotech doesn't really know this. And so biotech is always comfortable with things they know like small molecule drugs, antibodies, proteins, right? Those are knowns. Uh, this is a different uh, way of, 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 of approaching therapies. And we're very excited moving forward to demonstrate that they can have, they can enable therapies because of their longer half-lives because they are highly scalable. In, in some cases, you just have to make two small, relatively small peptides and you can tune uh, all of the properties, the solubility, the biodegradation rate, again, using the peptide sequence. So I think with that, I will stop here. And of course, always acknowledge my team who do everything and thank Neil again for the opportunity to speak to you and the opportunity to share our results with the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm getting some wows in the chat here and in the Q&A. Let's sneak in two questions. Um, one is from Ryan Cole. Is, is Professor Stoop looking for funding? And if so, is he open to working with venture capital, with a venture capital firm? Yes. Uh, yeah, we, we are interested in capital. We, as, I, as I said, we started a company uh, about uh, two and a half years ago, and we did basically a seed round. Uh, you know, from uh, friends and so forth. 
Uh, and but in the next phase, of course, we are going to be looking for capital, uh, and um, and we are very much uh, looking forward to speaking with with uh, potential partners. Yeah, Joan is on record. She's saying, as a healthcare consulting actuary, I think of how many lives this could change. Um, there's some comments about presentation of uh, the molecules on the surface of these supermolecular therapies. Um, but we've got maybe time for one more, which is from Z, Z Y Chen. Um, interested in, um, can the platform be extended to uh, and amenable to covalent binders as opposed to non-covalent interactions? Yes, I mean, of course, uh, in, you know, we have in the past, you know, in our research, we have in fact um, uh, demonstrated that you can uh, covalently bond the molecules, inter you know, internally. In fact, in the very first paper uh, uh, that we published, uh, we, we did show that uh, using disulfide bonds and cysteine residues in the peptide. But, but you know, this can also be done to the tail. I mean, you can create covalent bonds uh, between the molecules. Uh, you, could, you could do partial covalent bonding as a way to tune properties. Uh, and of course, you can always covalently bond um, uh, proteins or other bioactive components uh, to the molecules of the supramolecular structure. So you, you can either create the bonds internally among the molecules or just functionalize molecules of the assembly uh, via a covalent bond. You know, both options are possible. Okay, uh, Sam, thanks so much. That was um, scholarly and deep and translational, right? On target, thanks so much again. Thank you, Neil, very much for the opportunity. 100%. Um, so there's lots of other uh, comments and chat and, co and questions. We'll, we'll try to convey those to, to Professor Stupp. Um, that concludes our Northwestern faculty presentation. So thanks to Shana, Beth, Peter, and Sam for taking time out of their schedules to join us today. Um, next up, uh, we've got a couple panels and more interaction uh, type model here. So next up is group of experts who will discuss some of the most exciting innovations in protein therapeutics and readout technologies for protein level uh, human biology. And the moderator of the panel is Karen, uh, Karen Tekach Tuzman, senior editor and head of discovery and preclinical development at BioCentury. Uh, welcome and take it away, Karen. Thank you very much, Neil. And it's my pleasure to be here today. And um, when asking about this panel, uh, I was told that part of our function is to sort of sit at the intersection between uh, the academic presentations you heard today and some of the industry focused uh, presentations that you'll hear later. And so um, I invite my panelists uh, to, uh, to join me in uh, their uh, camera and uh, I'm unmuting. Um, so today we have uh, gathered a, a great group to discuss um, some next generation technologies, their applications and the business case and uh, environment for it. Um, so I'll like to introduce uh, Parag Malik, uh, Associate Professor of Radiology at Stanford University and Founder and Chief Scientist of Nautilus Biotechnology, Vinnie Manny, Head of Platform at Profound Therapeutics, and Ginger Johnson, President of Commercial Bioconsulting at Lumanity. Um, and so uh, to kick off today's discussion, uh, I want to just give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves by saying, how does innovation in protein therapeutics and technologies show up in your day-to-day -day life at your companies, institutions? Um, what does that look like for you? And so maybe uh, Vinny we can start with you. Yeah, thank you, Karen, for the opportunity. Really excited to be a part of this discussion. Um, innovation in protein therapeutics is really um, what, what spurred the creation of profound therapeutics uh, in general. You know, uh, when we were first thinking about how uh, we were exploring effectively what we called the space of proteomic dark matter uh, at Flagship Pioneering. And really um, what kept coming up in the, our observations was that, you know, proteomic technologies um, to date haven't um, really moved the needle on uh, while, while they've made significant progress, haven't really moved the needle on us sort of potentially discovering potentially new 
proteins, right? And so in the context of Profound Therapeutics, we're really a bioplatform company that has set out to um, think about what if there were more proteins uh, in the human genome than were previously appreciated? And if so, what are the technologies are we, are we actually building in order to support the discovery of those and support the discovery of, of therapeutically relevant proteins? And we developed a number of tools to tackle exactly this question, sort of intersecting how do we leverage multi-omics data to now uh, elevate what we're doing in protein therapeutics, as well as think about some of the innovation uh, that's being done by several other companies, including uh, Nautilus, who's here today, um, in in terms of of sequencing and really being able to identify them. So we are in the business of expanding that parts list of proteins that comes from the human genome um, and innovating within that space, as well as incorporating technologies uh, to facilitate that. No, thank you, and that's a great uh, maybe transition uh, to Parag to talking about uh, how it shows up in your life. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think so. First off, thanks so much for having having me today. I'm really delighted to to be here with my other panelists. And I I think when we look at proteins in therapeutics, uh, 95 percent of of existing therapeutics target a protein, and uh, many of the therapeutics that are used today, whether they're antibodies or antibody drug conjugates or other protein molecules, are are great for addressing them. Uh, Nautilus came about very much my prior research at Stanford in systems medicine uh, was very focused on how do we take advantage of all the different types of ohms to do a better job of understanding how to develop drugs, how to find biomarkers that target those drugs more effectively, and recognizing that there was a gap, recognizing that the technologies that we had were, were, uh, were amazingly powerful, and yet we still didn't have all the information that we wanted. And so we think about protein therapeutics every day. We think about making it easy for every biologist to be able to access the proteome, to be able to merge that data with all the other ohms to build a complete picture of how biology works. And so uh, it, it is a part of how biology works. This is part of how, how cells function and dysfunction. And uh, our, our goal at Nautilus is to help illuminate how how all those processes work so we can do a better job of targeting them. Thank you so much. And Ginger, uh, how does your role and experiences inform your perspective on this space? Yeah, so um, also thank you to the organizers and, and my, um, my panelists. Pa panelists um, I'm lo really looking forward to this. Uh, let me back up and describe my role at Lumanity. Um, so president of the bioconsulting team, we focus on uh, providing strategic advice to early innovation. Um, so early stage companies with very early stage science and driving the value of, of that science. Um, so the companies that we're working with are more, I, I, I look at this space at two camps. Um, and it may be oversimplified, but technology platforms and data platforms. So technology platforms are a lot of the companies we work with, and I'm sure a lot of the companies that you guys will work with eventually. So the antibody drug conjugate companies, bispecific antibodies, um, target protein degra degradators, degraders, sorry. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, everybody is after the same goal, which is really identifying and developing these proteins as therapeutics, as targets, as biomarkers. So, you know, in, in my space every day, um, but I'm, I will call myself the, the odd man out here, Parag and Vinny, you, you guys are the experts. I'm probably going to ask more questions um, than I will answer. So I'll, I'll be Karen's foil. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Um, and yeah, as uh, Ginger alluded to, we have a lot of next generation proteomics experience on this panel. Um, so I was wondering if uh, you could weigh in on how the proteomics discovery space is evolving, what paradigm shifts it's bringing and what tools are enabling these shifts. Anyone can jump in. Um, Vinny, why don't you, why don't you just kick us off? <laughs> Great. Well, I'm actually going to take a take a page from your book a little bit, Prag, uh, in, in mentioning that, you know, I think you mentioned a lot of this is just part of the biology, right? And and I think 
ne to me, next generation proteomics and, and therapeutics sort of in general in, in the omics space really comes down to our appreciation of, of new biology and how it opens these vast opportunities. And so um, thinking about how we're gonna enable um, innovation in, in biotech and next generation proteomics in light of both uncovering from, from an academic perspective what that biology is, as well as disentangling that on the therapeutics end is really kind of uh, what is driving a lot of this evolution. And that said, in, in particular, sort of what we're doing at, at Profound is, is thinking through how are we gonna gain better resolution of, of, the, of the full parts list of the human proteome, right? How are we going to um, identify all the players in this biology? and it's really begun with um, advances in what we like to call translatomics, but I'll also expand that to say sort of um, this space of what everyone is calling proteogenomics these days. I know we all have a different definition of that, but um, I guess over the past few years, it's historically been how do you leverage now knowing the central dogma, right? Your DNA to RNA to protein, can you reduce effectively the search space of of what you are blasting your, your LCMS proteomics to leveraging RNA sequencing. Um, and surprisingly, what that does is allows you to illuminate more proteins in a sample by, by reducing what your search space is, right? Which, which I think has been quite remarkable. And so for us at Profound, really what we've done is, is to say, um, let's go to the ribosome, right? And use what the ribosome, the protein factory itself is actively translating and say, let's take that a step above RNA sequencing. And we are finding advances in translatomics really illuminating uh, our ability to now sort of complement mass spec-based proteomics and, and things like that. Um, and then sort of on another front, uh, so that's a little bit on the technology and the, and the detection front of next generation proteomics, but, but also thinking through from the therapeutic lens, right? We, we really think about what have been sort of the technologies that are enabling us to target proteins, whether it be an antibody, small molecule, um, or even uh, leveraging advances in, in delivering proteins as modalities in and of themselves. Um, and, and I think that in and of itself has also allowed for us to play around with the biology a little bit more. Yeah, that, that's a super, super interesting perspective. I, I think uh, when, when we look at the next generation proteomics space, we start by asking the question, why is proteomics hard? Uh, and what are the gaps? And when we think about the genome, the genome is relatively static. It's the same the day you're born as the day you die. Uh, on the other hand, your proteome is changing every second of every day and every cell in your body. And that, that diversity, that dynamism, uh, makes it an incredible challenge to study, but also an incredible opportunity because you're really able to capture statefulness. Uh, and so when we think about the next generation te technologies, they're addressing questions of sensitivity. You, know, you have things like transcription factors that are present in single molecule copies in cells or one to five copies. And whether it's one, five or 10 can have a material impact on the behavior of that system. So you need that extreme sensitivity and we're seeing platforms uh, emerging now that are able to get down to single molecules uh, and really capture where the biology is, but also at scale, recognizing that you have this tremendous range of, of proteins uh, in blood, 10 orders of magnitude. Uh, just to frame that, that's the difference between a poppy seed and the earth. Um, so imagine trying to find the difference between two bagels on two planets. Uh, that were identical aside from those two bagels. That's, that's the proteome challenge. And what we're seeing in emerging technologies is efforts to really dig down um, at, at that scale. Uh, I think the, the other place where we're seeing is we're recognizing with the dynamism of proteomics, the throughput matters so that you are able to measure a large number of samples, samples over time, the same patient followed longitudinally. Uh, and being able to address that is, is, is critical, really studying the dynamics. Uh, the other place where we're seeing a lot of movement, and Neil on the panel here is, is the world expert in this, is, is in proteoforms, recognizing that proteins are more than their fragment peptides. They're, you might have uh, things like histones that have many, many, many methylations on them alongside phosphorylations and, uh, and other proteins that have isoforms as well. And capturing that diversity of proteoforms, 
along with sensitively doing so and at scale, that's really the challenge that these, these next generation platforms uh, are attempting to address and really changing our understanding of the biology. And, you know, one thing that uh, we hear about sometimes is this idea of what will it take for proteomics and next generation proteomics to become as routine as NGS? Um, and so I, I'm curious, you know, will it ever? I, I, Rob, I'm, you can go first. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think um, I think proteomics will always be hard. I think, I think proteins themselves are challenging. They have a lot of biophysical diversity. So we talked about the incredible range of abundances, the incredible range of proteiforms, and uh, um, it's, it's a hard problem. So I don't know that we're, we're even with the most amazing technologies, you might say, well, okay, how do I, uh, how do I address all of the complexity of proteins? Will I ever be able to? I, I don't think the answer is yes. I think, I think it is such an incredibly hard problem, but I think we can do is we can make the tools available so that every biologist is able to make them a routine part of their toolbox to start asking those questions in a sophisticated manner, in a comprehensive manner. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic answer. And, and I would also postulate to say that I think even though NGS is relatively routine, right, uh, uh, for, for nucleic acids, some of the similar problems apply to that as well in terms of what are the nuances of, of modifications that we're picking up and, and you know, transcriptomes that haven't yet been mapped. And so um, I think it boils down to, uh, from my perspective at least, oftentimes we are still only able to go see what we are looking for. Um, and like I think as Parag has illuminated and, and folks like Neil have, have also um, illuminated through their work, um, it comes down to appreciating and illuminating the comp complexity of the biologies uh, and, and the cell types, but also thinking through, you know, what, what effectively is that, is that parts list? So if I'm looking at a T cell versus a B cell, um, how do I delineate um, what, what is biologically biologically relevant and important for us to, to sort of measure within that. Um, but in terms of sort of standardization, so I think kind of integrating proteomics um, and the work, the immense work that has been done by a number of folks in the proteogenomics space to really integrate um, what we have with next generation sequencing alongside um, traditional sort of mass spec based proteomics um, allows us to meld those biologies together from, from the multi-omics lens as well as I would say also building further computational tools that allow us to assess that. And, and folks like Mike McCaw uh, have, have, have gone, gone, taken big strides to, to really, to get us to softwares that we can leverage and utilize. But um, it still, again, comes down to how you're preparing your sample, how you're analyzing it. And so my only good answer is <laughs> we're only able to see what we're looking for. So how can we, uh, best illuminate that from a number of different perspectives uh, to, to really gain confidence in what we're looking at um, to make it a, a standardized enough process, including that, that allows us to build more software packages and, and tools that can be used uh, across, across a number of different labs and companies. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great point. And, and maybe just to double down on that, I think when we look at what, why is it that NGS is as prevalent as it is today? Um, part of it is it's, it's straightforward for any lab in the country to do a, a DNA prep and send it off to a core facility or have an instrument in their lab and uh, get high quality comprehensive data. Um, and then the ecosystem of, of tools on the back end is quite mature, that uh, we have a lot of GWAS tools, we have a lot of tools for interpreting and analyzing the data. Uh, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of standardization, both around the sample prep, as you mentioned, as well as they're sort of a canon for data analysis. There's lots of boutique analyses you can do, but you know, 80 plus percent of the field has an expectation. On the other hand, if you go today, uh, from proteomics lab to proteomics lab to proteomics lab, my guess is that there are slight tweaks in columns that are used in gradients and in, in, uh, in the software analyses that can lead to 
data analysis being complicated. And so one of the things we have to do as a field is we have to make it easier for not just proteomics experts, but every biologist to be able to access the technologies in a manner that is consistent, uh, reliable, and, um, and that's one of our, our great opportunities in the field. Ginger, uh, I'm wondering what questions come up for you when you think about these types of platform technologies. Yeah, um, my questions are around what drives success. So when you think about, you know, the business model, it's going to be at least to start, it's going to be razors and blades, consumables, right? And as you talk about looking at N NGS, yes, it's straightforward, but um, there's real risk of being commoditized in, in a market like that. So you look at companies like, you know, the poster child Illumina, and I, and I saw some, an article that Nautilus is the next Illumina, but <laughs> setting the bar a little high there, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> to be clear, I didn't write the article. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's awesome. We're all, we're all waiting to see. No, but you know, it's, Illumina, just looking back, they, they're Wayne Gretzky, right? They're, where's the puck going? And they're shaping the market. They're not waiting for opportunities. So, you know, driving the personal genomics with partnerships with 23andMe, um, cancer diagnosis uh, with diagnostics, with, with Roche, um, now prenatal testing, you know, just the, the long-term vision and strategy is just incredible there. So I'm wondering from you guys, you know, what do you think is, is proteomics different in that it is, it's a more te technically, I mean, you can be a leader and you're not going to be commoditized because you're better or do you have to, you have to go further? I, I think you always have to innovate and I think you always have to have your, your finger on the pulse of what customers want. Uh, we spend a lot of time reaching out to folks like Neil and saying, hey, Neil, what do you want? Uh, and Neil says, I want proteoforms. So, okay, great. Uh, and then, uh, and understanding what are, what are the needs? And those needs are going to evolve and they often are surprising. And so I think any company that's, that's choosing to be static uh, probably is going to struggle um, because the market's evolving. Um, as new technologies, as new data, as uh, new research comes about. Yeah, I think that's extremely, extremely well said. Um, and I, I know we all love to think about our specific fields as, I mean, I was a, an immunologist prior. We always like to think about our fields as special and difficult to understand. But I think coming from the perspective of there always needs to be innovation um, in, in the face of what are the, what are the questions that we're asking? And how are we advancing the world, both from an academic perspective and, and therapeutics and technologies um, that, that are applicable to, to, to many um, problems surrounding the world? Um, and the more we come together uh, with efforts such as this uh, to, to bring that together, I think is really going to be driving proteomics forward in particular and uh, allowing for the crosstalk amongst multiple other fields will really sort of facilitate that. Neil, so it's not name, as hard. <laughs> Neil, your name's been invoked a couple of times. Uh, do you have any comments? A absolutely. I have a, a daisy chain of, of thoughts that I will limit to three steps. But <laughs> I, I just find what the private sector has done in the past two years as really bold. And to really, you know, and some of them are coming out of uh, the field of genomics. And yes, without PCR, we understand that proteins are hard and proteomics are harder. Um, but let me try to bring some um, thought processes to bear. So, you know, making drug discovery more efficient. When you think of GWAS or the kind of talk that Beth McNally gave a little earlier, genetics needs to hand off the proteomics in a more streamlined fashion, in a more deterministic fashion. And to help uh, meet the, what I count as easily 2 billion of private sector investment to try to regularize or, or bring the technologies at the protein level to match the scale of our challenge, that is our biology. And proteoforms is one more precise, uh, you know, it is just complete molecular 
compositional analysis of proteins with all their modifications and to try to better detect and assign function to isoforms and PTMs. Um, and, and, and so that daisy chain leads me to the following, that the government, and the, there is a big role for government here to help all, uh, including the, the, the 20 new biotechs that are in this space of proteomics technologies and platforms of which Nautilus and Profound are two, that the government, like the Genome Project 20 years ago, stepped in and said, look, we're going to crack the back on this problem because it's bigger than any single university consortium or, or private sector group of companies, but everybody could feast on the, on the more precise analysis of the proteome. And that means it requires the government to uh, put in what I said at the outset was at least 1.3 billion over 10 years to do the analog of the genome project. And that is to create the reference proteome like we did the reference genome. It doesn't measure, mean measure all uh, of everything. Uh, no, we only did the thousand cancer genomes project after we had the right tech. And so that reference proteome which would be a set of about 50 million unique proteiforms, according to some estimates. Um, that's what I wanted to advocate for. And I, I think that the drug development industry is the, one of the most powerful lobbies um, to help unlock that government funding. And, and they, the government needs to match what the private sector's just, just done, which is a very loud statement um, about protein level biology. I'm, I went long, I'm, but uh, this is my core <laughs> passionate thoughts. I, I will stop and yeah, I'll just stop. Well, thank you for that uh, advocacy and perspective. I guess um, we're just about out of time. So maybe one last question I'll ask, and anyone can jump in and answer this, is you know, right now we're in a market crunch that is affecting um, biotechnology, biopharma as a whole. What kind of an impact do you think that has on uh, some of these platform technology-based companies that are really uh, exploring fundamental um, next wave things, but maybe aren't, you know, a drug in a vial yet. And um, anyone can jump in. Uh, I can start on this one. Um, uh, from uh, as sort of sitting at flagship pioneering at the intersection between this platform company, as well as a firm that does investment, you know, we, we still believe that great science is always going to produce great opportunities that the market is difficult, but the sort of advances in, in protein technologies and advances in our understanding of the biology um, are providing, um, you know, resources that didn't necessarily exist before that are valuable to the field. So whether it, it makes it, you know, harder in the short term uh, to, to sort of get there, um, I, I really think that no matter what, we are going to be continuing to drive uh, towards great science. And, and it's just maybe a little bit marginally harder to, to go and get that funding, but um, great science is always gonna produce great opportunities. I have some thoughts there. Um, you tell me if I'm on target. Um, you know, everybody's being hit um, in this market. Um, we saw the correction coming, but it's still painful. Um, but, you know, technology companies like yours gets back to the business model question compared to drug development, at least you can generate some revenue and you can generate some revenue pretty, pretty quickly compared to, you know, somebody taking a drug to the clinic and it's going to be 10 years and millions of dollars. So, so perhaps you're in a better position to, um, you know, set yourself up for, sustaining your own your own um, life, if you will, during this market downturn um, and generating some capital. But I don't know, do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think you have a lot of flexibility. You, you don't necessarily need to wait for the result of that clinical trial for, for a binary outcome. Yeah. Uh, and so I think in this kind of climate, this is the first time we've really seen this kind of an aggressive downturn since, you know, 2008, 2009. And so what it means for companies in the space is they have to really listen to their customers. They have to be rigorous with their financials and disciplined. Um, and those are not bad things. 
Well, on that note, I think we're out of time. So I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, the time to have this great discussion and my co-panelists for uh, joining me and uh, weighing in with their perspectives. And I'll turn it back to Neil. Okay, great. Yes, thanks, Vani, Farag, and Ginger, and Karen for hosting. Yep, thank you for bringing a, the platform perspective um, for proteomic technologies. Um, we'll pivot over. Uh, we're running about eight or nine minutes uh, shy of the goal, but that's fine. Um, and we're going to pivot it over to uh, the corporate presentations. Um, and first up, we've got uh, the vice president of large molecule drug discovery, antibody engineering, and protein chemistry in large molecule drug discovery at a little company called Genentech. Um, <laughs> Arvind, uh, Raj Paul, please take it away, Arvind. Oh, good morning. I hope you can hear and see me. I can hear you and I'm validate. I get all these chat, but yes, and you're you're good to fly. Um, right. There was also two questions from the last session. So from the last uh, um, panelists, maybe they could chime in on the Q&A box. Um, it's all yours, Arvin. All right, great. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak and uh, have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about antibody uh, therapeutics. Um, the reason why I chose to talk about next generation antibody therapeutics is uh, fairly obvious. They're the largest and most successful class of protein therapeutics. And Genentech has a long and uh, uh, very successful history in generating such molecules. And I personally have been involved with antibody therapeutics for a long time since my graduate school days. So I figured this would be something very appropriate for this uh, discussion today. So on this slide, I'm showing you the top 20 pharmaceuticals by sales in 2011. This list is put out every year by the Nyartsen Group at University of Arizona. And what you notice in 2011 is that there were six BLAs. Now, I had to be a little careful about BLAs versus NDAs because there were certain protein-based therapeutics that filed NDAs, and I did not count those, and that will become more relevant in the next slide. But here I just highlighted the BLAs with the check mark. And of these six BLAs, you've got three antibodies. The lead antibody in this, uh, the number 10 is Humira, and then you have Remicade and Rituxan. Now this situation changed dramatically in a decade. In 2021, now more than half of the top pharmaceuticals by sales are biologics or proteins, protein uh, that are made by uh, fermentation is another way of thinking about what are protein therapeutics versus NDA versus BLAs. And here you have eight antibodies out of these 11. You have Humira again for immunology, for uh, autoimmunity. You have Keytruda, which is pembrolizumab or uh, is an anti-PD-1 antibody for uh, cancer immunology. You have Stellara, IL-12 and IL-23 antagonist, again for autoimmunity. And you have Optivo, which is an anti-PD-1 antibody again. And then the Regeneron um, anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody, which obviously played a big role, particularly in the early part of the pandemic. And then you have daratumumab, anti-CD38 for multiple myeloma, Prolia, which is denusumab, which is an anti-rank ligand antibody, and then finally dupilumab, dupilumab. So as you notice that in a decade, we went from three antibodies among the top 10, top 20 to eight antibodies. And the field continues to evolve. Now, here's an aggregate view of market value of antibodies. And I want to start on the left-hand side with, in 1975, with Cesar Milstein and Kohler's invention of hybridoma technology, where the first monoclonal antibody was made. And you move on to 1986, where the first mouse monoclonal antibody is uh, is, is marketed, which is OKT3, an anti-CD3 antibody. And then you roll on from the left-hand side to rituximab, which in 1997, again, 
these are not dates of approval. These are just marketed value at these on these certain dates. The dates of approval were maybe a year or, or, or two years before those. And here you have rituxan, which is a chimeric antibody, where you have the FC is human and the variable domain or even the FAB or murine. Moving on to trastuzumab, which is chimeric, which was generated here at, at uh, Genentech, where you have the CDRs or murine content, but the rest is completely human. Moving on to panitumumab in 2006, sorry, 2006, uh, which is a fully human antibody, and so and so forth. And you see how there's a bit of a lag between 1981 to 1998, and then it starts taking off. And then in 2012, we're off to the races. So antibodies have become a really mainstay in protein therapeutics, and they tend to be in multiple therapeutic areas, as I'm showing on the right. The major therapeutic areas where we use antibodies are obviously oncology and autoimmunity, as shown in yellow and then gray. But the other therapeutic areas, such as infectious diseases and respiratory diseases, continue to evolve. These are some uh, figures from a, a review article that Paul Carter and I just recently wrote, and it's in press. And what I'm showing you is there are three large fundamental classes of antibody therapeutics. The garden variety standard antibodies, then you have antibody drug conjugates, which are referred to as ADCs, and bispecific antibodies. Now on the top left-hand side, you see that a majority of the therapeutics currently are IgGs or antibodies, and then you have ADCs. There were 11 approvals uh, recently, and so there's been a, quite a spate of approvals actually in the last few years, and this class of antibodies continues to evolve. And then you have bispecifics, fragments, and so on and so forth. Below that, I'm showing you again the therapeutic areas and where these antibody therapeutics are used. And then on the top right-hand side are common targets that are addressed by antibodies, chief amongst which are CD20 and HER2, but you have other targets such as PD-1, which are very important in cancer immunology, as we all know, PDL one and then on the extreme right-hand side is the SARS-CoV-2. And on the bottom right-hand side is delivery and the route of delivery of these antibodies, primarily given by intravenous, but there is an emerging trend to move towards subcutaneous for quality of life and ease of administration, even in acute and uh, hospital-based conditions such as oncology. So what I thought was I would talk today a little bit about how these three, the antibody trifecta as I call them, are continuing to evolve and where we are going with antibody therapeutics in the future. So I'll start with standard antibodies and talk about how we're changing the way we discover these antibodies, how FC engineering has become a mainstay in antibody therapeutics, how multimerization continues to become an emerging theme and this is sort of similar to bispecifics, and then conditional activation, which is a, no, a new way of expanding therapeutic index of such molecules. In the bispecifics arena, I'll talk a little bit about how we're employing different effectors, delivery, and multispecifics, uh, similar to multimerization. And then in the ADC section, I'll talk a little bit about how site-specific conjugation is now becoming standard approach and lower potency payloads are being explored and non-cytotoxic payloads are being explored. So how are we making antibodies? So on the left panel, I'm showing you the different types of antibodies over time. Obviously, when we first started making antibody therapeutics, there were mainly mouse antibodies. And over time, we evolved into making chimeric molecules, as I suggested earlier, where the FC portion was human, as you can see on the right-hand side, as shown by the blue, and then the, the variable domain or the region where you bind the antigen was murine. And then we took that one step further with humanization, where only the CDRs were of mouse content, to now recently where a majority of molecules that are now entering the clinic are of human, uh, are human antibodies. So there are four general ways on how you make antibodies. The obvious, the, the original way was the mouse hybridoma approach. 
but there are the in vitro approaches that, such as phage display or yeast display where you display the antibodies on the surface of either phage or yeast and have genotype and phenotype linkage and pan for your antigens of interest to identify binders and then optimize them to make fully human antibodies recombinantly. There are several transgenic platforms, chief amongst which transgenic mouse platforms, where you can now make antibodies from these animals where they have the immune repertoire as fully human uh, v, v, v segment containing uh, B cells. Now, there are many variations on the theme where you have either mouse constant domains or mouse PCRs with human variable domains or fully human molecules uh, displayed on the surface of mouse B cells. And then on the extreme right hand side, you have single B cell technologies where you can now isolate B cells, single B cell from either these transgenic animals or from human patients, particularly in the case of uh, antibodies against infectious diseases, where you can then pull out these and see and then and then sequence and clone them and make them recombinantly into human antibodies. This is now slowly evolving. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how the role of machine learning uh, is potentially going to change this in the future. Um, in graduate school, we all learned about Leventhal's paradox. And just to mention it uh, briefly, Imagine a hundred residue protein with three possible conformations per residue. And this leads to about three to a hundred conformations, which is about five times 10 to the 47 potential conformations that could be sampled with this protein of hundred amino acids. Now let's assume that you can sample these con conformations at the speed at which we reorient bonds or even at this rate at which a hydrogen bond uh, vibrates. Uh, this is about 10 to the 13 structures of vibrations per second. So that's the time to explore all the conformational space for this 5 times 10 to the 47 would be about 5 times 10 to the 34. And that would be about 1.6 times 10 to the 27 years, which is greater than the age of the universe. So this was Leventhal's paradox, because yet in nature, we know that proteins fold in milliseconds. So this has been a long-standing problem, which underpins the protein folding problem. And this was recently uh, solved to a large extent by a machine learning algorithm called AlphaFold2 uh, in the CASP uh, test that is done every two years. In 2020, AlphaFold2 was able to solve about 100 uh, protein structures from primary amino acid sequences with the level of sophistication and accuracy that is almost equivalent to that determined experimentally. In the middle panel, I'm showing you, in blue are the experimentally determined structures of alpha helical and beta sheet containing proteins. And in the red, you have alpha fold predictions. And in the green, you have predictions using purely physics-based approaches such as Rosetta fold. And you see that in both instances, with both Rosetta and with AlphaFold, you get very good prediction with helical proteins. And with beta sheet proteins, while the, the physics-based approaches do get certain parts of the proteins, they do struggle with the beta hairpins, while the AlphaFold versions are doing remarkably better, although not perfectly. Now, antibodies and antibody binding structures are comprised of these beta hairpins. And in green on the right-hand side, you see the native structure of the CDR3 loop, which is the main loop in the antibody that binds antigens. And then in red or in the orange group uh, uh, shade is the Rosetta. And in purple is the machine learning uh, prediction for CDRH3. And in all three instances, you see that, and in both instances, you see that they sometimes get portion of the loops correct, but struggle with the, to the tip of the loop. This is to suggest that while I think there is potential to use machine learning to predict the structures of antibodies, there is some work to be done in trying to identify the appropriate confirmation for CDRH3s. And this is an area of active interest, both internally and externally in the field. Now, FC engineering has become mainstay. And on the 
table on the bottom part of the slide, I'm showing you some of the approved molecules where you have either abrogation of uh, FC uh, binding and, and effect of function in blue, and in pink, the activation or enhancement of FC effect of function. And if you look at the panel on the left-hand side, if you, in red, are regions on the FC that are mutated quite often in order to enhance the FC gamma receptor binding to increase effective function. Now, the whole engineering aspect of enhancing FC gamma receptor binding is to ensure that you enhance binding to the activating receptors while either main, maintaining or reducing binding to the inhibitory receptors, which both bind in the same region. And then on the bottom, you see in blue how you reduce FC gamma receptor binding by making mutations, and in some instances, in the same residues. On the right-hand side on the top, I'm, talk, I'm showing you regions of the FC that are often mutated to change binding to FCRN. And the whole intent here is to enhance binding to the FCRN in acidic pH while not changing binding at physiological normal pH 7.4, where, where the FC has to be released from the FCRN as the FCRN recirculates back to uh, the surface of the cell. So these are standard regions that are now mutated in FCs of, of antibodies to in order to be able to not only enhance or abrogate the factor function, but also to enhance the exposure and half-life of such molecules in, uh, in, in blood. Now, standard IgGs are bivalent by nature and employ effector functions by not only binding FC gamma receptors, but also employ effector functions by binding C1Q and engaging complement based uh, cytotoxicity or CDC. Now, there are multiple forms of antibodies as well that nature produces, such as IgMs. And in the bottom panel, I'm showing you IgMs that can either, and this is a cryo EMs image of IgM as either a hexamer or a pentamer, depending on the availability of the J chain in the pentamer versus the hexamer. And on the top, I'm showing you the general structure of this pentamer where you now have 10 binding sites. The differentiating characteristic of IgMs from IgGs are that they do not bind FC gamma receptors and only, re only rely on complement-based activation to, to, for, for effective functions. Now, a few years ago, Ian Wilson noticed that in the unit cell of structures of full-length IgGs, there was this interaction between FC portions of neighboring molecules. And he and others at GenMap wondered whether this was not, in fact, an artifact of IgGs, but whether there was some inherent binding affinity between neighboring FCs. And they started engineering these three positions, 345, 430, and 440 in the FC domain of IgGs, and were able to show that when you mutated these, that you could make molecules that were normal IgG, bivalent IgGs in solution, but hexamerized in, once they bound their antigens using the FABs. And this is another way of now enhancing the ability of such molecules and use them as therapeutics. And these tend to be particularly employed in, in cases where you want to agonize receptors that require homotypic interactions in order to transduce signals, such as TNF receptor superfamily members. So there have been several examples in the literature where people have used this against targets such as CD40, OX40, 41BB, and so on and so forth. And the final emerging theme in Standard IgGs is what I call conditional activation. And conditional activation can occur in many ways, as I show you by this uh, figure on the left-hand side, where you have masked antibodies that do not bind their targets in the periphery, but when they get into the tumor, become unmasked by either proteolysis or by changing in pH and so on and so forth, and then bind their targets. This allows them to not bind targets in the periphery and preferentially bind the targets of the tumor, thereby enhancing the therapeutic index, which is primarily driven by some level of toxicity uh, engendered by binding their target in the periphery. Now, there are many ways to do this. 
One way is to have this mask. Another way is to have a targeted approach where you have a tumor-based target that then brings in an effector cell or an APC cell. And then you either have on the third uh, panel from the left-hand side, a tumor-targeted mast antibody, which is removed, the mask is removed by proteolysis. And then on the final panel, where the mask is now removed, or there is a conformational change in the binding site of the antibody in the presence of a metabolite or in the presence of, of tumor pH. So this was something that I used in my lab a couple of years ago, where on the right-hand panel, we took CTLA-4, and we wanted to engineer a tumor-specific CTLA-4 because CTLA-4 blockade in the clinic leads to a fair amount of toxicity, particularly GI tox, that prevents its usage in the clinic beyond 10 mix per kg. And there is data from the clinic that suggests that if we were able to dose CTLA-4 or epilimumab beyond 10 mix per kg, that we could get further benefit to patients, particularly in melanoma and solid tumors. Epilimumab itself is shown on the top panel where you see that epilimumab binding to CTLA-4 is quite uh, independent of pH. It binds equivalently at pH 5.5 versus pH 7.2. And as you go, we engineered a couple of variants of epilimumab, and I'd like you to focus on AP 105 and 106, where you see that AP 105 and 106 bind CTLA-4 fairly well at low pH, but lose binding to CTLA-4 at high pH. They have a similar footprint on, on uh, CTLA-4, just as epilimumab, because they are derivatives of epilimumab. And then on the bottom panel, I'm showing you that when we inject these into animals with CT, I think this is MC38 tumors, they're equivalently active in uh, tumor growth inhibition as epilimumab. And the bottom panel, I show you, however, the immune profile of such molecules is different. In the tumor, you see that they're equivalently uh, potent in, re in reducing T-Rex as epilimumab. However, in the periphery, they have a very different profile than epilimumab compared to, uh, and are similar to the isotype control, suggesting that you could have a different profile for these molecules when injected into patients and perhaps expand the therapeutic index using such a uh, similar theme. Moving on to bispecifics. Um, there are many ways to make bispecifics. There are fragment-based approaches, there are asymmetric and symmetric-based approaches, and there are in fact over a hundred ways and formats of bispecifics. Now bispecifics are continuing to become emergent, as I say, particularly in uh, oncology and in cancer, as you see on the plot on the right-hand side. The most common way of using bispecifics in um, antibody therapeutics is shown on the panel on the left-hand side where we use bispecifics to bring an effector cell close to a tumor T cell, uh, a tumor cell, um, in this case, a T cell by recruiting T cell with CD3 binding and activating T cells in proximity to tumors and thereby um, killing tumor cells. Now there's an emerging ways of using other effector cells such as NK cells using CD16, binding, and there are a couple of molecules in the clinic, particularly from companies like Affimed, where, we are trying, where we're, they're trying to use NK cells as effector cells to attack tumors. The emerging theme in the field is that in solid tumor indications, where bispecifics have not been very successful thus far, that they may need, in addition to recruitment of T cells using CD3 and activating through the T cell receptor complex, T cell receptor complex, that they would also need uh, co-stimulation. And in this case, there are people who are exploring co-stimulation through receptors such as 41BB, where you see on the right-hand side, the T cell response in the presence of co-stimulation with 41BB enhances this uh, bispecific response in solid tumor indications. So this is another emerging theme in the use of bispecifics in solid tumors. Using bispecifics to deliver antibodies into the brain is also a very active area of interest. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you that the blood-brain barrier prevents transport of protein therapeutics into the, into, the, into the central nervous system. One of the most common ways that are being employed to transport 
antibodies and protein therapeutics into the brain is through receptor-mediated transcytosis. And on the middle panel, I show you some of the common receptors that are used. This is transcript levels of these receptors in blood, brain, uh, in, in brain microvessels. And one of these receptors is transparent receptor. And companies such as Denali are using transparent receptor, and they have a binding domain that was engineered in the CH3 domain of uh, antibodies as shown on the right-hand side that binds to transparent receptor in a monovalent fashion. And when this FC is engineered on a beta secretase antibody, they've shown that when this was injected into mice and monkeys, that the distribution of such molecules between brain and plasma was significantly enhanced. Now, I want to say that while this enhancement of about 24, 10 to 20 fold was uh, significant, we're still at about 1% of the injected dose getting into the brain, suggesting that there is still significant room for improvement in trying to enhance delivery of antibodies into the brain. This is uh, from a recent um, review article by Ray Deshay, who suggests that multi-specifics may be the fourth wave of uh, protein-based drugs, particularly antibody-based drugs in the clinic. And some of these antibodies use sequentially obligate multi-specific drugs. And here I want to distinguish between obligate mechanisms and combinatorial mechanisms. By combinatorial mechanisms, I mean basically combining two antigen binding sites in one molecule to make a, a multi-specific molecule. Obligate mechanisms require co-engagement of both the binding sites, either in tandem or in sequence in order to be able to affect a biological outcome. So in this case, he distinguishes between sequentially obligate uh, multi-specific drugs and, current, and concurrently binding obligate multi-specific drugs that mediate localization or function as matchmakers such as protax. And on the right-hand side, there was a further uh, expounding on this obligate bispecific mechanism or multi-specific mechanism as shown by Paul Parron and co-workers, where you have either a bridging of two cells, as I showed you earlier with CD3 bispecifics, or receptor inhibition in cis, or receptor activation in cis, or cofactor mimetics such as hem libra, or a piggyback mechanism where you bind your first target to get across, such as the blood-brain barrier, a transparent receptor, and then bind your second target in the CNS, or a piggyback mechanism where you bind your first target on the cell surface, and then when you get inside the endosome, you bind your second target, such as the case shown on the right-hand side. So these are other mechanisms of using uh, multi-specific molecules. Maybe about another minute there, Arvind. I'm going to wrap this up very quickly. The final is, is antibody drug conjugates. And in the antibody drug conjugates, there are still several molecules in clinical trials. And most of them are directed at solid tumors. And the payloads that are used are mainly mitotic, anti-mitotic payloads, and also DNA damage payloads. And the common targets are HER2 and EGFR. And the conjugation classes are now slowly evolving into site specifics. And the whole premise of antibody drug conjugates is to enhance the therapeutic index, meaning to reduce the minimum efficacious dose and enhancing the maximum efficacious, uh, maximum tolerated dose uh, from chemotherapies. Now, there are anti antibody drug conjugates are fairly complicated by nature. You have to modulate the tumor target antigen binding, the antibody, the cytotoxic payload, and the linker. And the emerging idea here is the site-specific conjugation is becoming preferred, where you have a very uniform drug with a very uniform drug to antibody ratio, or DAR, as you can see in the bottom right-hand side. And these molecules make for not only well-characterized molecules, but also very stable molecules where you can study the structure activity relationship of putting the particular antibody and payload linker in a specific spot versus in other spots of the antibody demonstrating very different uh, uh, PD effects. Now we spent a decade trying to use ultra potent payloads and this is now evolving into using less potent payloads such as SN38 or uh, topoisomerase inhibitors, but also to use other types of payloads such as radio 
uh, like radionuclides and even things like antibiotics as we've done at, uh, at Genentech. And, and, then to, and then the field continues to evolve uh, with antibody with different types of payloads and also non-cytotoxic payloads. So that's the end of my talk, just to tell you that I think that the future of antibody therapeutics is bright as all three of these antibody classes of therapeutics continue to evolve with time. And with that, I'll finish my talk and thank you for your uh, attention. Thanks so much, Arvind. Uh, great survey and review, some details in there. And, um, i learned a lot, thank you. There, there's, we've got time for a question um, from Trevor. I'll read, uh, what are some of the challenges for fusion antibody proteins showing efficacy and reaching the market? What are the challenges for uh, antibody therapeutics? For fusion um, antibody proteins, yeah. Oh, I see. Particularly. Yeah, because now you have to modulate not only binding of the target with the antigen binding form, but also modulate the, the activity of the fusion partner. And this leads to very complicated PD, monitoring PD effects, but also to also look at exposure of the two entities. If they are fused, you wanna make sure that you match the exposure of both entities appropriately and localization of both entities. And that makes it fairly complicated, but not impossible. Okay, uh, great, thanks. Thanks so much again. Um, we'll be moving straight away to our, our next and second corporate presenter, the Vice President of Research, Biologic Therapeutic Discovery. Um, at Amgen, another heavy hitter. I give you Alan Russell, please. Alan, take it away. Thanks ever so much. Uh, and uh, uh, just a quick sound check and a visual check. Is everything working okay? Check and check, Alan. You're good to go. Check. Wonderful. Well, you know, I'd like to thank everyone for hanging in here to almost the end. And uh, I'm delighted to take some time to talk to you about uh, how at least at Amgen we're thinking about the grand challenges of protein therapeutics and how we're going about addressing those grand challenges. One of the beauties of uh, looking in the crystal ball and uh, giving a talk like this is I'm just looking at the crystal ball and obviously not making commitments. So uh, with that out of the way, let me just sort of dive in. And uh, here on this slide, there's a lot of words to read, but basically I'm trying to stress that all of the science that we're doing, whether it's multi-specifics, uh, convenient dosing, conditional binding, many of the things you've heard about throughout the day, that science allows us to go to the real destination of, of what we need. Things like oral delivery, bringing down the cost of goods to increase uh, accessibility of our drugs, uh, so many other things. And I'll come back to this uh, uh, as we wind our way through the conversation. To get there, there are these waves of new science that are all cresting at the same time. And it really is an incredibly exciting time in protein therapeutics uh, and, and in, in the kind of drug discovery uh, that we've been talking about as each of these elements of science seems to do more and more and move faster and faster, we can really begin to address the core challenges of our business. So what are those challenges? And, and in many ways, I think almost all the presentations today have presented amazing science that maybe haven't brought out the dirty laundry quite as much, but there is a little bit of dirty laundry. And the reality is, is that we're in a business where we have to work incredibly hard spend many, many years, many billions of dollars to bring a drug to market because most of the time it doesn't work. It doesn't work because either the target wasn't quite what we thought it was, the molecule, the drug itself didn't do quite the right things in quite the right way and maybe didn't even behave in the right way. And perhaps the clinical in indications were also challenges. So these really are the ultimate grand challenges of our business. And if there are ways of new science which can dramatically shift uh, what we're able to achieve in each of these, then we can look at a very different uh, future on the horizon. Just very briefly to dig into this a little more, you can think of the early biotechnology industry. And I would remind everybody 
still on the call, that back in the 1990s, there were a lot of people that didn't think biotech was going to be a thing. Um, but basically, there were a lot of targets. Here, they're indicated as the fruit in the tree. And we had rather short ladders at that time. And the, the ladder represents the drug discovery process. So we have the target discovery process, the drug discovery process. And sure enough, we went about picking much of that fruit. In the last few years, however, much of that low-hanging fruit has gone. And in order to pick the higher hanging fruit, we have to do the kind of extraordinary science that you heard Armin lay out for you, whether it's antibody drug conjugates, multi-specifics, many of the things that the industry is trying to do now, it's just harder. And those ladders don't really exist uh, and aren't quite as stable as, as the ladders of the past. So why am I so excited? Why do I see this as, as, uh, as a really interesting problem? Well, really what it shows is, is that this process that, that we go through to find new protein-based protein antibody therapeutics or antibody-like therapeutics, uh, we've used the same process for many, many years. We basically uh, use uh, an animal to make a repertoire of potential leads, millions of potential leads. Uh, we then, and that may take a year or so, and then we take, depending on the complexity of the molecule we're trying to find, we sift through that, uh, that haystack, as it were, to find needles in a process that takes years uh, to do that. So the question, of course, becomes, what can we do about that existential grand challenge of the fact that it just takes too long? And at the end of the process, we end up with a molecule that still has liabilities, that still behaves differently in the clinic than we might have designed it to, or even during further development and manufacturing. Um, what you might really think about is that uh, we're at the place, you know, where we're in the today's winner's box. There's going to be new science for finding new targets. You've heard about some of that uh, today, for, especially from our academic speakers. There's also new science, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in depth, uh, in order to find the new molecules. So you can climb the x-axis, climb the y-axis. You can go along the y-axis. And in order to get there, in order to find uniquely competitive therapeutics, you have to bring those two things together. Our own strategy at Amgen in order to climb the y-axis is called Biologics Next. Next just stands for New and Experimental Technologies. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that. Uh, and in order to get into that, I just want to really reflect on the reality of the business. It's a high cost business. It's not fast. It's fairly low efficiency when you think about the number of molecules that we have to make to find one that really works. And the success rates of each of the steps along that drug discovery process are not perfect. So that at the end, we still end up with drugs that have challenges, that have sort of liabilities. And the best place to remove liabilities during drug discovery and development is right at the beginning when we find the drugs. So we really are, uh, you, you know, Arvin gave a, a wonderful talk and uh, uh, I think in, in some ways just made it sound like this is kind of easy. This is not easy, what, what he was talking about, to do these things. But traditional antibody discovery is something we're exquisitely good at and everything uh, about that. Um, maybe where we need to go is, of course, automation, miniaturization, high throughput, in silico discovery, we'll talk much more about that. And we need to get to a place where we can actually assemble the kind of complex molecules you've been hearing about, almost like Lego pieces. You could think of it as like Legomics, uh, assembling these molecules together. Uh, so how do we do this? How do we shift from what you might think of as incremental innovation uh, to disruptive innovation and really uh, shifting timelines? I want again to encourage you to reflect on the way we do things today, making these molecular haystacks and using wet lab experiments, helped sometimes by computational design, obviously, to create final drug designs, uh, final protein leads uh, that are the needles 
uh, that will move forward into the therapeutic development pathway. Uh, where we need to go is what we call a generative approach. We're calling this generative biology. And that's the idea of bringing together really high level biology with automation, high throughput uh, systems and AI and machine learning to inform and to predict what the right candidate drug designs are and what the lab experiments will be in order to uh, get to the next level. Why is this important? Well, I, if you remember just one slide uh, by the end of the presentation, this would be the one I think to remember because this, this is what makes this problem so vex vexatious. So, you know, if you're firing a rocket to Mars, uh, everything about how that rocket will be designed and how it will land on Mars in exactly the right place, an extraordinarily complicated problem, is predictable. It's predictable because we have a series of equations that describe the physics necessary to do and the chemistry necessary to do what needs to be done. Unfortunately, of course, in biology, we don't have a fundamental set of principles, equations that allow us to go from sequence to structure to function and thereby limiting the success of our drug discovery processes. If we could unveil those uh, remarkable connections, those algorithms that would link sequence to structure to function, we could do sequence-based discovery and really launch uh, a, a new paradigm where we drive the timeline of development down and push up the success rate so that we have to sift through fewer molecules to find leads and so that the leads are more predictable. So how are we doing this? I'm going to talk about generative biology in a second. I just want to mention that, uh, that we're very heavily investing in, in this assembly of therapeutic molecules using biology, chemistry, and design, looking very carefully, obviously, at RNA-based therapeutics. And everything is built on the assumption that we have an extraordinary platform of digital biologics discovery. But now let's dig in a little deeper into generative biology. So, you know, what you've heard about so far, the current state of the art, is a process where, again, we use animals, we find leads, and then and the needles, and then we polish them with analysis, with prediction, with automation robotics. We really are rather good at that. In generative biology, which takes its name from generative computational models, the idea here is, is that rather than developing AI algorithms that allow us to say, if this is the sequence, these will be the functions of those molecules, which is kind of in the current state of the art. But to be able to say, if this is the sequence and we want this particular function, this is how we should change the sequence. So in other words, we create a loop. And now for the first time, perhaps, we can really learn from each program in order to enable the next program. So we can be targeted, we can be in silico driven, we can decrease cycle times, be highly efficient. And what we're doing is creating a series of partnerships, acquisitions, uh, uh, corporate partnerships, academic partnerships. We're really open uh, to learning from people on the outside that will enable this cycle to be accelerated. What are some of the challenges? Well, what I just talked about, bringing together new biology, new automation, new computational mechanisms, it's complicated. It's building a very complex uh, uh, set of puzzle pieces, each with their own grand challenges. Uh, you know, so every, every area in which we're innovating, uh, those waves of science bring with them challenges. And so we have to not just invest in breaking down each one of those issues, but then in building the puzzle and bringing it all together. I'm going to give you a, a quick look at some examples of what you would be able to do if, if you could do the sequence-based discovery, what the impact would actually be. And obviously, I'm picking on things where we're working uh, really hard. But here's one, may not be one that you think about a lot, but it's one that's at the heart of the failure of many uh, leads uh, that go all the way to clinical development. And that is the simple issue uh, that a lot of these molecules that we make have a tendency to stick to each other and they aggregate. And once they aggregate uh, in an unpredictable way, that can cause a problem. 
So we end up the all, you know, one of the only ways to really figure out if a molecule aggregates is to make a lot of it. So if you have a lot of leads and you have to make a lot of them, you invest a great deal of time uh, making molecules that you then have to remove. If there was a machine learning model that was just 90% accurate, it would reduce the number of failed molecules that we make by 60%, and we'd have to do 20% fewer wet lab experiments in order to find that clinical lead. So obviously we're investing very heavily, we're super excited about, about the space of simply being able to take a protein sequence agnostic of, uh, of um, the format of that protein sequence and predict uh, its aggregation propensity with a 90% accuracy. Uh, another example would be thermal stability. A key issue for all therapeutic proteins is their thermal stability. Uh, if we can do the same thing, if we can predict thermal stability with machine learning and AI, generative models rather than discriminative models, uh, in this case, if we had just a 70% accuracy, 70% accuracy going from sequence to predicted thermal stability without ever having to make the molecule, this could filter the number of experimental sequences we actually have to manufacture and test by more than 50%. So very significant impact there on the timeline. So again, we've been investing heavily uh, for the last few uh, number of years uh, in this space, building these in silico tools, bringing it together with uh, elevated uh, biology uh, in order to change the success rate and the timeline of, of drug discovery for protein therapeutics. And uh, already uh, what we found is remarkable reductions in timeline and, and really exciting increases in the success rates uh, that we observe for our uh, antibody uh, engineering timelines. Um, another example of where we're spending a lot of, of time is that if indeed we can do the sequence-based discovery, then wouldn't it be nice if we had animal models that actually allowed us to do NGS sequencing of the entire B cell repertoire at one time. And so we've invested pretty heavily uh, in, in a platform called the UniRat, uh, where it's a single chain version of the antibody. And it really is the ideal animal platform that allows us to pivot and do pure sequence-based discovery. Uh, so it's a wonderful in vivo partner to an in silico platform. You heard a little bit about AlphaFold. Here's just a really nice example. This is an E3 ligase where the team had spent, I think, two years trying to make this protein unsuccessfully. Uh, uh, I think they tried eight times, eight different ways to manufacture this uh, protein, but it was just horribly unstable. They couldn't do it. AlphaFold came along within a couple of months. We were able to predict the structure of the protein, identify where in the protein the problem was, engineer it out, and within just two months, we're able to actually make the protein for the first time and start a drug discovery program around the use of this protein. So very exciting advances. I just wanted to show you how we can use something like AlphaFold to transform what we're doing. And let me just finish up uh, by mentioning that the kind of computational tools that I've talked about are now somewhat traditional. But there is also non-traditional computing that's coming along fast quantum computing, for example. So quantum computing, uh, it, you know, kind of changes everything. Uh, for a long time, it's been quantum-inspired AI. Now, this is a, a slide here uh, uh, taken from IBM's timeline of, uh, of their prediction of when uh, quantum point computers will be ready. But you can see that already online today, uh, uh, actual quantum computers that you can use. You can sign up, you can go and use them to solve interesting problems. And as, uh, as we see this develop, we need biology to be ready for quantum computing so that we're able to solve the kind of problems that only quantum computers can solve. So what are we doing? Originally, I have to tell you, this was a five-year plan. We're having to rethink uh, biologics next now because in just one year, We've been able to halve the timeline of antibody discovery and double the success rate. Uh, our protein engineering timeline is way down. So we're really excited about this generative biology era uh, that we're in. 
So the short story uh, uh, to finish up is, is the grand challenges of finding those therapeutic targets, the therapies themselves, the molecules themselves, and the indication. Those grand challenges are the defining elements of our R&D productivity in the biotech industry, whether it's a large company or a small company. These tools that I'm talking about should and can really transform uh, what we're able to achieve here. And we need to sort of adjust our thinking uh, to meet the opportunity. Those waves of scientific opportunity are cresting. So I'll just finish with this slide. Uh, uh, if those of you that are wondering where, where this is, I believe it's Navarrete in, in Portugal, where people surf giant waves. And the point I'm trying to make here is that you can stand on the sidelines and you can watch the waves crest, you can watch full and you can watch other people uh, surf the boards. But I think the key really is, especially for a company like Amgen, is to look to, uh, look to people in the industry, look to people in academia, and then pick the right board, pick the right technology, pick the right platform, and then really ride the wave. And just accept that if you ride those waves, you're gonna fall sometimes. And then you just gotta get up and repeat. Uh, but the, the future is bright. Uh, the horizon seems to be getting closer uh, all the time. So with that, I'll finish and uh, hand it back. Thank you. Alan, thank, thank you so much. That, um, I just was in a really elevated place, you know, listening to those remarks and the metaphors and, and the details. Just, you know, really a tremendous way to think about the epoch that we're in and entering. And so this decade, we're going to really try to ratchet up the efficiency of the whole industry. And, and you, you gave us some tactical thoughts about how that's going to happen. And um, yeah, protein level biology, not, uh, it, it, we could be leaving this decade in a very different place. And that's, that's the aspiration. Um, I think I think due to time, what I'll do, Alan, I, I, um, uh, a little bashful to say, but just given that we're about 12 minutes late, I, I'll just pivot to move us uh, into the last session. And if you have. Uh oh. Jay, I think that's your uh, introduction to launch the and next session. Jay, I'll, without any further ado, Olson, and I'll give you his title. Um, um, great. Okay, Jay, take it away. Thank you, Neil. On behalf of Oppenheimer, I want to thank you. We really appreciate the collaboration, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with you, Sheila, Lisa, and the amazing faculty at Northwestern to put together this exciting event. To quote a great mentor, Professor Andrew Lowe at MIT, one of the many omics that sometimes gets ignored in biotech discussions is economics. So now that we've seen all these impressive presentations describing the amazing work being done by our friends at Northwestern, Amgen, and Genentech, we'd like to address the question of how these innovative scientists get the funding required to bring these novel new protein therapeutics all the way through development and eventually to the patients who need them, because ultimately that's the end goal is to benefit the patients. So we have a few slides to set the stage before we jump into the panel discussion, starting with starting with this slide showing that biotech underperformance relative to the broader market is worsening with decreasing market cap. So the Russell 2000 Biotech Growth Index on the bottom is the poorest performing index compared to the NBI, XBI, and the S&P 500. The next slide shows that M&A, which normally increases when biotech valuations decline, has not increased and in fact has been decreasing and so this M&A lifeline that we would expect to eventually rescue a biotech downturn has not yet occurred. Another phenomenon that we've observed during the biotech downturn is the proliferation of IPOs, which set records in 2020 and again in 2021, and it's now dried up. Although biotech investors have to put their money somewhere, and so fortunately there are still private financings taking place. 
And when you add it all up, you get to this slide, which is again, based on data from, from Professor Andrew Lowe, who has shown that all of the funding that flowed into new public biotech companies in 2020 and 2021 has increased the risk of research programs. And as a result, the success rates of clinical trials has been declining. And it's this real or perceived risk that could be preventing M&A deals and IPOs for biotech companies. So with that, we're now honored to introduce our host of expert panelists, all of them experts in the area of financing and investing in biotech. And they're here with us today to share their insights. I wanna welcome our distinguished panelists and thank them for joining us. I'm gonna ask each of you to briefly introduce yourselves and we can go in alphabetical order. So Margarita, if you could please get us started, that would be great. And also I think we can probably stop sharing the slides. Perfect, thank you. Sure, hello everyone. 